All right, welcome for this week's Rising Tide Foundation lecture, where we are continuing our journey into debunking certain uh, very dangerous myths that have been cooked up to uh, blind us to the solution of putting out the fire, basically. Like our house is on fire and there is water abundant, but that requires that our mind's eye be able to not only understand our history, how we created every burst of progress, every um, leaping over, every moment that we bravely le leapt over the limits to growth, um, and escape the, sh the trappings of feudalism, the systems of empire that wanted to enslave us over the course of all of human history. Um, our current age is enjoying the fruits of a lot of these, these sacrifices made by people who were able to tap into a certain source of understanding about the nature of humanity that gave them the courage, the insight to navigate through a lot of very difficult situations make discoveries, translate those into new forms of technologies, and that includes political technologies, the idea of government founded by and of and for the people. That's a, That could be considered a form of political technology, a metaphysical technology that has not been static but has improved or deteriorated inversely, right? As, as In periods where stupidity became too normalized, we've seen those those uh, technologies those of, of law – um, misused, destroyed, and used increasingly to suppress the many who it was designed, who the law was designed to protect and defend. So the current age, because we are so de severed from this history, we, we are ripe for all sorts of misinformation, reframing of um, information that has caused people to think that their problems are caused by some mixture of um, of Russia and especially of China who are just framed all, of, you know, we get this in the media full spectrum every day. We've been getting this for years are the the, the villains, the, the global supervillains who are at the, the heart of all of our problems. And people have overlooked what has really been at the heart of the, the efforts to destroy not just us here in the, the West, but also Russia and China themselves. And, and we've and because we don't have that or we so many people have lost that, they become very susceptible to thinking that um, – or not even seeing that that Russia and China have done battle successfully. The leadership there have been able to organize themselves in a certain way that has allowed them to do carry out a form of battle against this oligarchical parasite. And we could be learning from that. We could be working with these nations in collaboration um to to deal with real universal problems like hunger war ignorance we could be doing this together but instead we got the the chinese supervillain boogeyman uh, repetitions again and again pounding in our ears so we've had a series of presentations over the past weeks dealing with the different elements of this going into some deep history some deep history of china the battles for a uh, creating a, a viable educational system both in the west and in the east uh, today, we're going to usher in, we're shifting gears a little bit, so this is a nice bridge as we go into a series of lectures on the uh, the question of science unshackled. So different different ideas that have been withheld by design um, around the question of what is science, what is technology, what is the, the healthy versus unhealthy way of defining these things, and what has China done specifically that has allowed them to accomplish certain things that we used to we used to do ourselves back before most of us here uh, who, are, who are present in this Zoom room before we were even born. So I have known Fox Green now for some time, and I am just always blown away by the quality of his output, his analysis, the films that he and uh, and his and and Alex have put together. Um, who is also listening today and will be doing next week's lecture, Alex uh, Dimitrios, um, is just really outstanding work. Uh, Space Commune is uh, the platform that Alex and Fox established and is a really wonderful resource. The, again, deeper analyses on energy policy is fantastic. Um, so Fox agreed to do today's lecture on the topic of the truth about environmentalism in China and the pagan origins of ecology which is a very provocative title. I'm looking forward to seeing how this spins out. And uh, Fox, you have screen sharing rights. Like usual, what we'll do for the Q&A is everybody, after the formal presentation is finished, we'll, I ask people generally to write their names in the chat box or raise your digital hand. Um, and I call upon you um, accordingly. 
Similarly, if you want me to read the question, just let me know and make it a very concise, short question that you type out and, and I can read that if, if you want that. So that's it. Uh, Fox, it's all yours. All right. Well, thank you. Um, it's very exciting to be here today and chat with all you folks and, and give this presentation. This is a big one. It's a big topic. Um, it's broad and deep at the same time, but I think you're the perfect audience for it. Um, I, I love the content that um, that Matt and Cynthia put out there. I think is right in line with what we're doing as well. Um, so let me, let me start by screen sharing here. Get this going here. So I do have a pretty uh, a pretty meaty presentation here, and I have a lot of content I want to get through. So if at any point I'm if there's something that I'm unclear about, if I'm breezing through topics too quickly, or you you can feel free, Matt. Maybe you can moderate. See if there's if there's questions that are pertaining to what I'm talking about at the moment. Otherwise, we can save them at the end. Um, I'm going to try to get through all my content as, as uh, you know, not, not too quickly, but breeze through it. Cause it's a bit, it's a big topic, but it's important. I think it's really important that we get through this stuff. Um, China and ecology, right? Some of the, the big picture stuff. Um, so have people here heard of ecological civilization? Who here has heard of ecological civilization? Just so you know, everybody's on mute by default, so you won't necessarily get easy uh, responses. That's fine. You could say it to yourself. It's just sort of like talk to yourself. It, it, just answer for yourself. Okay, so who here has heard of uh, degrowth? Have, have people here heard of degrowth? Yeah, that's probably a little bit more common, right? Who here has heard of China? Yeah, most people have heard of China, right? Okay, so let's let's talk about all these things, right? Uh, there's There's narratives in the media. Um, things that you might hear from left wing or right wing, depending on what you listen to, or maybe a more centrist alternative perspective, but there might be certain things that you hear about China. Um, so what I'd like to do today is talk about sort of an overarching theory that maybe people have about China in general. Um, so the theory I'd like to present to the group today and, and kind of think about this ahead of time um, is that China is an eco-Marxist Malthusian superpower and that uh, it's fundamentally different than the United States, um, that it's going to take over the world with degrowth, communism, and ecological civilization. So that's why I was asking if people have heard of these concepts because these these are some of the things that maybe come up when people hear about China as they, they think these things. So let's let's lean into this thing and 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 see if there's any truth to any of this theory right let's 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 dig in um and i think that the elephant in the room that i'd like to get out of the way right away is china marxist um that's like a big scare word for westerners for good reason right um a lot of the people who are trying to tear down um, our civilization right now, our our countries, our our nations, whether you're in Canada or uh, the United States or in Europe, um, a lot of people who call themselves Marxists are trying to are actively trying to tear down our countries. Um, but yes, uh, China uh, is a government that defines itself as Marxist Leninist, um, and they refer to their country as socialism with Chinese characteristics, which is important. Uh, it's important to note that they are, they're not just socialist, they're socialist with Chinese characteristics. And we'll, we'll see more about that um, later on. So even so, um, even though they call themselves socialist, communist, they're, you know, the communist party is the, the one, the one party system that they have running their government. Um, a lot of Westerners, have a hard time classifying whether China is capitalist or communist. Um, they say the success of China is because they employ a free market or a capitalist economy, yet all major industries are nationalized and the private market is heavily managed by the public sector. So does this classify them as capitalist because they're growing and prospering? Or are they communist because they control industry? They don't just let the free market run the show, right? This is this is what a lot of Westerners have a hard time 
classifying China as if they're if they're good if they're bad it's because they're communists if they're good if they're doing well it's because they're 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 capitalists or they're did I did I reverse that you know what I'm saying if they're bad they're commies if they're good if they're doing something right it's because they're doing it the capitalist way so it's a little bit of both right so what I'm going to propose is that maybe we shouldn't worry about classifying their economy for now let's let's put that aside right because either way whatever they're doing is working you know it's it uh, in contrast to what's happening here in the west what china is doing is working their people are becoming richer uh, their economy is growing um that's just the truth of the matter so let's put aside the whatever we want to call their economy whether we want to call it capitalist communist socialist it doesn't matter to me right now. But what we can dig into is Marxism, right? So they call themselves Marxist-Leninists. Um, but what's interesting is that Marxism is a Western ideology. It's not Chinese. It's not Eastern. It's not an Eastern philosophy. Um, Karl Marx was born in 1818. Uh, he's a German philosopher who lived in London. He's a young Hegelian. Um his life's work uh, was predominantly a critique of British capitalism, which arose from the Industrial Revolution. Um, Marx was vocally opposed to Malthus and anarchists. Um, and Marx was a champion. The biggest thing about Marx is that he was a champion of the working man. So our first example of a Marxist-Leninist nation or you know, bigger than that, right? There was the Soviet Union was like multiple nation states in a in a union. Um, so what's interesting about that, we, we should take a look at the Soviet Union, right? Um, and the values that they that they purported. So the Soviet Union was very pro worker, just like, you know, Marx was pro worker. Um, they were very, very pro development uh, and pro energy infrastructure. Um, Lenin said uh, communism is Soviet power plus electrification of the whole country. They, they were they're big into industry. And Stalin uh, really industrialized the country. They took it from basically a peasant economy into a modern economy. Um, and if you look at their accomplishments in the 20th century, uh, they won the space race. You know, they, they hit all the markers um, because they were very pro-technology. Uh, they were very much into space exploration. Um, they were very, very internationalist um, and egalitarian. So they weren't nationalists like like Germany was, right? Like the national socialists who thought that Germany was the best country ever and had the right to uh, grow and have Lebensstrom and take over all of the neighboring nations and eventually the world because it was the best. Um, the USSR was very much into international uh, solidarity with other countries um, the same way that we see with China today and, and Russia as well, um, modern Russia, which is not considered a communist country anymore. Um, they're very, very socially progressive. So I'm going to show just a, a few pieces of, um, you could call this their propaganda art, very commercialized art of the, the later 20th century. Um, and you could see they were very much uh, in favor of equal rights for women. Uh, Mao had a famous quote of uh, women hold up half the sky. Um, very, very uh, socially progressive um, and very pro-humanity, very much anti-Malthusian um, into growing populations. Although we do see um, instances like towards the end of the USSR, people like Gorbachev being a, a huge Malthusian. Um, but that's, you know, a whole a topic onto itself. But initially, the USSR was very much guided by these principles. And we can see some of that um, very plainly if you look through. And I'm a graphic designer. So I love these posters are very like graphic design. Um, I think they're very cool. They're very crisp. Um, and so I'd like to just breeze through a few of these. So and they're very easy to find. I, I highly recommend just for fun to look up Soviet Soviet posters 
because they're they're really graphically beautiful and they have really cool messages too. So this this one says your and mine work is for your native country. Um you could see the the workers includes a woman um and they're all, you know, they're hard hat just industrial workers. Um what might look like Trump voters today, right? <laughs> In the United States, but um you can see the emphasis on industry. We see this giant, um, what is this, like a oil oil rig or something. And we can see the, the pylons and the farming. Um, here we see, so you could see their leaders are Marx, Engels, and Lenin. Um, but they were all about independence, socialism, uh, discharge for social progress, labor, safety, no arms race, no war, no to racism, uh, international communists and labor movement is the vanguard of the revo revolutionary work, uh, forces of the world. Um, here's another one. The people in the party are united. Let's welcome the uh, elections, the Supreme Council, of the USSR with new success in labor. So we see more posters of just industry, workers, uh, women always included in that. Um, stop the arms race, ensure peace in the whole world, cooperation for anti-imperialist solidarity, socialism, dis disarmament, uh, democracy, friendship, social progress, solidarity, peace. That's what all these little signs say down here. And they're in, they're in different languages too. So um, very internationalist sentiment. Um, this one says, citizens of the USSR have all the fullness of socio socioeconomic, political, and personal rights and freedoms proclaimed and guaranteed by the Constitution of the USSR and Soviet laws. A Soviet man is the owner of his country. He is the only creator of power of the power and wealth of society. So, um, you know, the communist ideology, this Marxist-Leninist ideology is very, very pro-worker. Um to contrast it with some of the other types of of leadership and qualities that we talk about, you know, it's not it's not an aristocratic society. It's very egalitarian, very pro worker. Um, but I think that there's some very admirable qualities here, right? That are embodied. We have um, we have the scientist, we have the 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 laborer leading the way here, and we have a you know we have a woman too because very um, equal society, very progressive society. Um, we see industry here again on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, we see space. So very forward-thinking, um, a very forward-thinking um, country, uh, organization. Um, and here's here's a poster, which I liked a lot. It says, be careful to the public be careful to the public goods. So um, it kind of translates weird. And then the the little worm guy is labeled grabber. But you can see that what what was important to the Soviet people um, was industry, right? We see um, we see dams, we see grain, we see electric pylons, we see cars, uh, cities, building. Again, this is this is what their values were. This is the values of the Soviet Union. Um, this one says glory to the workers of the Soviet of Soviet science and technology. They were very, very uh, pro space exploration. Uh, they led the way with this stuff um, very much into nuclear energy um, and for, for peaceful use, right? Adam for, for the intended purposes, uh, which is industry, right? And wealth and uh, growing your economy, not for war, which was hanging over everyone's head during this time, during this period. These are pro these posters are probably all from 60s, 70s. This one says, uh, let Adam serve peace, not war, which is a great sentiment, I think. Um, this one, the fairy tale became truth poster, celebrates the 12th of April 1961, the day when Yuri Gargan became the first man in space. The Soviet hero is portrayed with a star in his hand like a modern Prometheus. He is bringing light to the nation. And they also had the first woman in space as well. So, um, you know, you can criticize the Soviet Union all you want. I, I think that it warrants criticism. Absolutely. 
Um, they did not get everything right. And clearly they, you know, they collapsed. But uh, I think there was a lot of sentiment in this experiment that uh, was pushing them in the right direction, right? This poster says, be proud, Soviet man. You opened the path to the stars from Earth, which I think is a really, really wonderful sentiment as well. It's very, very future oriented, um, very Promethean, very humanitarian, um, very cool, right? I, I think. Um, and also in China as well. So China had their revolution in 1949. Uh, the Communist Party of or the Communist Party of China took over. Um, here's a quote from uh, Mao: "It is a very good thing that China has a big population. Even if China's population multiplies many times, we are fully capable of finding a solution. Revolution plus production can solve the problem of feeding the population. Of all the things in the world, people are the most precious." All, pessim all pessimistic views are utterly groundless. So again, really nice sentiments, very pro-humanity, very anti-Malthusian sentiments from uh, the USSR and communist China in the, in the middle of the 20th century. So if these guys, if these, if these nations, if, if the USSR and China were following and some still are in the case of China, uh, a Marxist Leninist ideology. Um, then why, why in the West, and, and Marxism is a Western ideology, it, Marx was a, a German who lived in, in, in London. How come, uh, and, and, and he was supposedly anti-Malthusian, what went wrong along the way? What, what the hell happened that uh, now we see books like Marx and the Anthropocene um, towards the idea of degrowth communism, which a book that just came out then last year or so. Um, this is a picture of, of Marx uh, on, a, on the cover of uh, Der Spiegel, a German magazine from within the last year. And he's got like, uh, his, he's got a, a wind turbine necklace and he's got, there is no planet B He's got all this environmentalist stuff and he's got the recycling tattoo. He's got, um, he's got a feminist tattoo. So uh, maybe the feminist one's a little bit easier to see after all the Soviet posters, right. With all the women, but it's not in the same, it's not the same kind of feminism that we have in the, in the U S in the West. Right. Um, you know, and I'd like to just, also make make a note about the Soviet posters that I know that they're very idealistic, right? And they might have been covering up some of the less idealistic things that may have transpired. And think for a minute also, contrast that with some of the artwork that the commercial art or propaganda that we had coming out of the time in, in the United States, which was very idealistic as well, right? But it was more commercial oriented, right? It was more about buying products, more about individualism. So just a little food for thought with that. But um, so really, I mean, what I want to sort of dig into here is, is Marxism a little bit, right? Because how can China, which is currently a, a Marxist Leninist country or says it, says it claims to be, um, how can they be doing so well while the Marxists are basically destroying our country. Well, how how does that work? How, how does that contradiction exist? Um, and I think what we have to do uh, is really dig in to the multi-headed beast of the 19th and 20th century to really understand um, how this happened, how we got to this point um, in 2024, where Marxism means one thing for one country and one thing for another. How can we resolve these contradictions? Um, so here's this beast represented by a bunch of, a bunch of heads, which you might recognize. So we have, uh, we have going from left to right, we have Ernst Haeckel. Um, I have him representing pseudoscience, um, things like ecology and the second law of thermodynamics, which we'll get into. Um, then we have Alan Dulles, who, um, 
all of you will probably recognize as the the leader of the CIA who is responsible for the murder of uh, JFK and um, all kinds of terrible, terrible things um, in the 20th century that kind of destroyed our country from the inside out. When I say our country, I'm I'm an American, just just so that's clear. Um, um, who do we have next? This is uh, Adolf Helsinger um, up top here. He was uh, Hitler's top guy, Hitler's uh, chief of staff, I believe. And then he afterwards, he transitioned to uh, the head of NATO, right? One of the top guys of NATO. So NATO was uh, this thing that was created um, after the close of World War II to keep, um, to basically keep the Russians down, to keep the USSR down. But we'll get more into that. Um, and then below him, we have... Um, Helena Blavatsky, and um, she represents the religious cults of this beast, um, things like theosophy and nature worship. Um, and then moving right, we have, uh, if anyone recognizes this guy, this is Paul Ehrlich. He's actually still alive. He's one. Of, he's the one that's still alive here in this in this diagram. But he is one of the most famous neo Malthusians. Uh, became very popular in the 1970s with a book called The Population Bomb. Um, crazy guy. He was actually the featured guest on 60 Minutes, the first featured guest on 60 Minutes last year. I couldn't believe it. So he's still he's still kicking around. And then below him, we have John Maynard Keynes, who represents bad economics, things like deindustrialization, um, decoupling from the physical economy, um, in the background, you can kind of see little things like NATO. We have um, limits to growth. Um, all of these things sort of coming together, right? Coming together um, as the multi-headed beast. So uh, to, to zero in on one angle of this, uh, we have the origins of the Congress of Cultural Freedom. I'd like to read this document from, this is declassified from the CIA. Um, so this, I'm not sure when this document is from, I, I think it's from the seventies. You can find it on the CIA website. So give me a hundred million dollars and a thousand dedicated people. And I will guarantee to generate such a wave of democratic unrest among the masses. Yes. Even among the soldiers of Stalin's own empire, that all his problems for a long period of time will come to be internal. I can find the people. And that's Sidney Hook in 1949. So that's a little um, quote to open up this passage here that we'll read. So the Congress for Cultural Freedom is widely considered one of the CIA's more daring and effective Cold War covert operations. It published literary and political journals such as Encounter, hosted dozens of conferences bringing together some of the most eminent Western thinkers, and even did what it what it could to help intellectuals behind the Iron Curtain. Somehow this organization of scholars and artists, egotistical and free thinking, and even anti-American in their politics, managed to reach out from its Paris headquarters to demonstrate that communism, despite its blandishments, was a deadly foe of art and thought. Getting such people to cooperate at all was a feat, but the Congress's administrative secretary, Michael Jolson, kept them working together for almost a decade for almost two decades until the agency arranged an amicable separation from the congress in 1966 the congress for cultural freedom despite its embarrassing exposure of cia sponsorship in 1967 ultimately helps to negate communism's appeal to artists intellectuals undermining at the same time the communist pose of moral superiority so I mean, you you could see the in the in the the artwork that we saw before, there was a, a lot of moral superiority, right? They were very progressive. They were leading mankind in in a positive direction, very egalitarian, very equal. But while the CIA sponsorship of the Congress has long been publicly known, the origins of that relationship have remained obscure, even to agency veterans who worked on the project. 
The Congress itself sprang from a conference of intellectuals in West Berlin in June 1950, a gathering that itself marked a landmark in the Cold War. By a lucky stroke, the conference opened just a day after North Korea invaded the South. This coincidence lent unexpected timeliness and urgency to the conference's message that some of the best minds of the West, representing a wide range of disciplines and political viewpoints, were willing to defy the still influential opinion that communism was more congenial to culture than was bourgeois democracy. Historians have surmised that this event had some CIA connection, but the handful of CIA officers who knew the full story are dead, and scholars today tend to skirt this issue because of the lack of documentation. Agencies Agency files revealed the true origins of the Berlin Conference. Besides setting the Congress in motion, the Berlin Conference in 1950 helped solidify CIA's emerging strategy of promoting the non-communist left, the strategy that would soon become the theoretical foundation of the agency's political operations against communism over the next two decades. So they say it's against communism, right? Personally, I think it's code for anti-Russia. Um, that's my my personal opinion. But I would like to um, just share a quick video. This um, this video is uh, a short clip from uh, a documentary that I put out about two years ago uh, called Marxism and Energy, which walks through deeply the history of Marxism and how it changed to what we see as leftism today. Um, and how it's very Malthusian and anti-energy. Um, but here's just a short clip that I'd like to um, share because it uh, very clearly goes over the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Um, and the speaker uh, is, is someone named Caleb Maupin, um, who we interviewed on our podcast. And I later turned several podcast episodes into this documentary film, Marxism and Energy. So um, let me switch this over. Make sure I'm sharing the sound here. Because starting in 1949, the CIA launched a pro program called the Congress for Cultural Freedom and started funneling money to anti-communist leftists. Generally, the people that made up the Congress for Cultural Freedom were followers of the Trotskyite Max Schachtman. And Schachtman, uh, after World War II, his followers, uh, one of them being Irving Kristol, who is the father of neoconservatism, started working for the CIA. And Irving Kristol was actually the director of the CIA's Congress for Cultural Freedom program, where they started covertly giving money to leftists uh, in order to put out an anti-Soviet uh, message. Um, and uh, the magazine Partisan Review, which was a purported to be a communist socialist magazine, and it was all over the college campuses. Every campus you went to, you could find a partisan review. And it was this subversive communist magazine, except it, it like every issue was devoted to exposing the Stalinists. And uh, a lot of the, you know, what was done in partisan review magazine was equating the Soviets with the Nazis, right? And saying that, that it's basically the same system. And direct CIA payments to, to pay for their operations were supplemented by uh, the Ford Foundation and uh, the Rockefeller think tanks and other things. And various left-wing academics were getting subsidized by getting paid lots of money to have their articles appear in this magazine that was everywhere. And this was the conscious manipulation. And uh, you talk about the Frankfurt School and, and the rise of, of this new, and it's weird because on the right, they have this whole thing about cultural Marxism. Right. Well, well, what they're missing is that a lot of these like cultural critics that really emphasized Gramsci really downplayed the idea of class struggle, uh, you know, you know, emphasized, uh, you know, you had Herbert Marcuse, who said that the working class was not revolutionary, the intellectuals were the revolutionaries. All of this was being covertly supported as a way to kind of direct intellectuals and leftists away from Marxism. And in the process, they changed really the nature of what leftism was, you know, the anti-populism came out. Susan Sontag is a really important voice in this milieu. And, and so Hannah Arendt also comes out of this. Um, and anti-populism, the idea that average people are the enemy, that average people are dangerous, and if they ever get together and start fighting for their rights, uh, that's that's basically the same as Nazi Germany. That became a big theme in what it meant to be a leftist, this kind of intellectual nonconformity. So um, what Caleb said is true, you know, the what was thought of as communism and leftism 
uh, prior to World War II um, didn't seem incompatible with um, the with with Americans, right? Uh, we were very friendly with um, with communist Russia, uh, Stalin, and and um, Roosevelt had a great relationship. There's a whole book written about it, um, but you know the powers that be couldn't couldn't let that stand. They couldn't let um, they couldn't let America and Russia be brother nations, which is what we're meant to be, right? Before World War II, Russia was was always our uh, um, a friendly nation with the with the United States. Um, and after World War II, they had to they had to keep us divided. So uh, there's a quote from Lord Ismay, which I think still rings true today about NATO. Um, this guy was um, head of NATO in the BNA, I think, um, a British agent, of course. Um, so NATO, he said, NATO exists for three reasons: to keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. And if that doesn't ring true today, I don't know <laughs> what does, because that's certainly um seems like the theme uh you know putin even even said in his inter his amazing interview uh with tucker last week that he tried to join nato but they weren't going to let that happen um so i think that the 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 thesis behind nato is still ringing true today and especially keeping the germans down too right is um keeping them sort of they're deindustrializing their nation. Uh, they just shut down their last nuclear plant last year. Um, so, and, and and to keep us Americans in NATO, um, I think that's that's one thing with the the Trump, uh, the 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 threat to the globalists of a new Trump uh, presidency that they see is is him pulling out of NATO, um, which would be great, I think. Uh, but they are already taking actions to prevent that from happening which is unfortunate. Um, but so these things, NATO, uh, Congress of Cultural Freedom, we could talk all day about those things. But what I really want to dig into today is the philosophy, the theology, and the science uh, underpinning this multi-headed beast. So um, the first thing I'd like to tackle is um, a new religion to replace Christianity, right? The West is no is like the guiding principles of the west there's christianity right um the us is a christian nation um but in order to uh subvert an ideology or a religion or a theology such as christianity um that is very pro humanity you need something to undermine that and that is what ecology is so we'll start at the beginning so um, the person who coined the term ecology was a man named Ernst Haeckel, who was born in 1834 and lived till 1919. He was a German zoologist, uh, a eugenicist, a uh, biologist, and an artist. Probably know him best by his uh, his drawings, which I'll show a little bit of those. He, but he was the one who coined the term ecology. He also happened to be a huge Darwinist, as you could probably tell from this picture of him next to a monkey skeleton and holding a, a human skull, not a not a stretch of the imagination. Um, he created something called the Monist League, which is very important. We'll get into that. Um, he was a pagan um, and he was very uh, opposed to Christianity. Um he was a major influence on the Volkish and Nazi movements in Germany, which we will dig into. So you might know him best by his artwork. That's kind of what he's famous for now. It's, you know, people buy his posters. Um, he was very influential on in the Art Deco movement, as you can see in this poster on the right-hand side. Um, this, this lamp was sort of designed based on his these drawings that he did, these very botanical looking drawings of, uh, you know, microscopic organisms. He was, uh, he was really into nature. You get very inspired by this geometry and nature, I suppose. Um, I don't know. It's, it looks a little satanic to me. <laughs> I don't know what you guys think of this. It's interesting to contrast this though, to the, the Soviet posters. Um, so keep that in mind, right? So I'm going to read a little bit from this book called 
um, the scientific origins of national socialism, which finally got a hard copy in the mail. Um, it's an excellent, excellent book. I highly, highly recommend uh, picking up. I found it pretty easily, um, a free copy of a PDF online. It was written by a man named D Daniel Gassman in uh, 1971. Um, and he really digs into Ernst Haeckel, who is an important and very overlooked figure in all of this. So the fact remains, however, that on a basic level, the history of national socialism in Germany and fascism in other countries like Italy and France should be viewed largely from the perspective of the scientific culture rooted in evolutionary biology that emerged under the sway of Haeckelian monism during the second half of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. National socialism, which superficially considered, appears to be an anti-rational movement that was highly skeptical of science, demonstrates rather a profound connection with certain heterodox traditions of scientific thought, above all, the tradition of Haeckel. Haeckel's evolutionary monism was formulated as early as the 1860s and soon achieved a great, great popularity as the authoritative voice of modern science. Monism's influence extended not only to the biological and anthropological sciences, but also to a host of ideologies and social movements whose philosophy depended upon an ostensible scientific mandate for determining their ideas and agendas. Many of these movements were progressive, left liberal, and Marxist, but at the same time, what somewhat par paradoxically, mystically oriented individuals and groups also fell under the sway of monism, such as proponents of the Volkisch nationalism in Germany, who desired to create a new kind of nationalistic consensus by synthesizing romantic, racial, and scientific beliefs and adepts of spiritualized nationalism in Italy, adherents of Toscanita, who were also revealingly inspired by the scientific, scientific in quotes, maxims of Haeckel's monism. In addition, around the turn of the 20th century, important branches of theosophy, such as the anthropological, anthroposophical movements of Rudolf Steiner, also consciously and enthusiastically became linked to Ernst Haeckel and to the German Monist League. Theosophy helped to inculcate a general inclination for mysticism in European intellectual life, thus aiding in the creation of the general anti-rational zeitgeist that contributed to the crisis of reason, pervading the intellectual environment of the end of the 19th century, and in turn helped nourish, uh, nourish the birth and development of national socialist-like ideas. So basically, Ernst Haeckel was, he was a science guy. Um, he was a science, what we might call today a science believer. He said, I believe in science. <laughs> but that's, that became his religion, right? And he, he worked to become, to create a new religion around science. Haeckel's monism advocated a fundamental and radical departure from the established intellectual and moral traditions of humanistic and rational science drawing upon alternative, heretical, and non-Christian traditions of thought that stressed, among other things, the absence of a personal God, the meaninglessness of existence, the essential amorality of the cosmos, and opposition to linear, progressive conceptions of history, his general assumption that the monotheistic God was dead, that mankind was divided into separate and eternally divergent biological races, that the transcendental religions were rooted in anti-scientific superstition, and that morality was a was historically relative, where ideas that came to be accepted m among many of the educated and semi-educated classes of Europe as irrefutable truths that were sanctioned by the most up-to-date science. Over time, Haeckel's notions were increasingly radicalized and eventually served as the as a major theoretical basis for national socialist activity. So a true believe, a science believer, right? From the very beginning. <laughs> In denying the existence of a transcendent God and stressing the eminence of a spirit within matter, 
Haeckel intentionally rejected the ethical demands of the conventional revealed religions, and he argued forcefully against the supposition of the uniqueness of man or the prospect of historical progress. According to his monist philosophy, the political realm operated not in progressive linear stages, but according to the ultimate cyclical destiny of the cosmos. Therefore, society could not be organized in any any other way than as blindly adhering to the morally indifferent laws of nature. To subvert nature and its amoral rules would inevitably and fatally weaken mankind and lead to its racial and physical demise, an accusation that he leveled at Christianity with its roots in ethically imbued Judaism and the Mosaic Code. Political life for Haeckel meant simply carrying out the will of nature. He argued indefatigably on behalf of the idea that politics had to be understood as applied biology, an idea that would, in time, become one of the cardinal theoretical uh, political principles of national socialism. It's a pretty pretty sick individual, huh? <laughs> Haeckel's advocacy of a religion of monism was intended as a substitute for conventional religion, and his new secular religious creed achieved surprising popularity among substantial number of the educated elite in European societies. So it became very in vogue to believe this new this new religion of, of Haeckel, the, the monist, the monist religion. Um, especially among the ranks of the cultural avant-garde in the late 19th century and early, early 20th centuries. These newly formulated scientific religious ideas also influenced broad strata of the population who were intimately tied to the burgeoning way of life of technically advanced industrial and urban civilization. Scientists, engineers, physicians, pharmacists, and teachers, along with self-educated proletarians who frequently received their smattering of formal education by attending social democratic work worker institutes, where the curricula were heavily infused with monist content. Monism even influenced free-floating members of the so-called lumpen proletariat, like Adolf Hitler, who cast adrift in rapidly growing urban commercial centers, were also searching for an ideology that could make sense of the confusion, alienation, and hardness of modern industrial and social conditions. So just as a, as a touch point here, monism uh, is the idea of, of single, right? It's an opposition to duality. So um, there are, I would say, Platonism is uh, dualistic. There's um, two competing realms or, or two two realms, right? And and monism just says there's just it's just one. It's just everything is it. <laughs> there's no duality um, at play here. Um, so Haeckel and his monist followers seldom lost an opportunity to criticize established religion. They viewed Christianity as the principled force in the modern world impeding the victory of science, and they accused established religion in Germany of spiritual decay and political reaction. In the place of the Christianity they continually denounced, the Haeckelian monists proposed that a new pantheistic religion of nature be created, which would, would they felt, more adequately serve and express the spiritual and national need of the Germans. So you can see here where a lot of this sentiment, I mean, it makes sense to me where a lot of this sentiment that we see today, where we see, you know, people who are more scientifically minded say that they're, they're secular or they don't believe in sky daddy, or, you know, they say it's kind of derogatory things about Christianity um, and religion in general. And they say they're atheists or, or whatever. And they say they just believe in science which is ridiculous to me. You can't believe in science. Science is a tool that you use to learn how the world works. Um, it's not, it's not a belief system, but we can kind of see the roots of where that began here in Haeckel who created, he overtly was a scientist, right? And a uh, so-called scientist. And um, he, he used this cachet that he had with the uh, burgeoning community of people who were kind of rejecting um the old stuffy religions, which 
a lot of them were used to control the population, keep people down, keep people, you know, in these false religions. Um, and there, you know, people around this time were kind of rejecting that. And but they need something, right? We're human beings, and we can't we can't operate without a, a, a system, a belief system. So in the vacuum of that, um, that gave rise to people like like Haeckel to create this sort of a revert to a, a pagan religion that was dressed up as cutting edge science, right? That was cutting edge and new, um, but was actually very uh, pseudo scientific. Uh, very much based in irrational mysticism um, and nature worship. So it was overtly religious in the beginning, even though people now try to say they pride themselves on being anti-religious, um, which I don't I don't think you really can be. I think everybody needs a, a moral code as a, as a human being. We don't operate without one. Um, so just as a little contrast here too, I'd like to contrast... Uh, Marx and Haeckel, which is still from this book, from Gassman. Um, so Gassman writes, despite these similarities with Haeckel, the parallel between them should not be overemphasized or carried too far. Admittedly, dialectical materialism, as rigidly formulated by Engels, stressed evolution and determinism, while at the same time underplaying the importance of man's creative social role in history, which is bad, very bad, <laughs> in my opinion a theoretical assumption which had been stressed earlier in Marxian philosophy. But even granting this, Engels nonetheless did not maintain with Haeckel that there existed an absolutely literal and direct connection between the laws of nature and man. Ultimately, for Marx and Engels, and despite the influence of Haeckel, it was the economic forces of production and not the Haeckelian laws of nature which were really the decisive factor in human history. Like most others, uh, like most other non Haeckelian social Darwinists, Marx and Engels conceived of the relationship between man and nature, between nature and history, only in broadly analytical, analogical terms. It should be kept in mind that Marx, who often departed from the economic determinism that is the basis for historical materialism, tended, especially in his earlier writings, to place much emphasis on the independent role of human consciousness in shaping the course of history. For him, man is related to nature only through the social world and the industry which he creates. Unlike Haeckel, who completely rejected free will, and Engels, who appeared to deny it, Marx famously wrote, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. There were also moments when Marx dismissed the social insights of Darwin himself. He once observed that all Darwin had discovered in the natural world was bourgeois society writ large. It is noteworthy, he wrote to Engels, how Darwin rediscovers his English society, with its division of labor, competition, the opening of new markets, inventions, and the Malthusian struggle for existence among the animals and plants. It is Hobbes's Bellum Omnium Contra Omnes, which is the war of all against all. And it reminds one of Hegel in the Phenomenology, where bourgeois society figures spiritually as an animal kingdom. Whereas in Darwin, the animal kingdom becomes bourgeois society. Implied was the understanding that it would become that it would be ludicrous to attempt to derive a meaningful ethic from the Darwinian natural world. So this is, I think, very interesting because it is both critical of Marx um, and determinism, um, this and uh, material deterministic attitudes, which I think are a very large problem with Marxism. But still, you have to give Marx credit, right? Is that he he did believe in man's creative conscious ability um, as trumping uh, nature, and he rejected this idea of a war of all against all. Um, at least he did here in his criticism of Haeckel and Darwin. So it's some food for thought, right? Um, just to see the contrast of these people who were both alive at the same time, you know, Haeckel, Haeckel and Marx overlapped um, 
as being you know contemporaries at the uh, at the same time um so it's it's interesting to see the this war of ideas play out um having concluded that nature was alive Haeckel elevated predominant scientific hypothesis of the 19th century, such as the theory of spatial ether and the laws of the conservation of mass and energy, to the level of religious dogma and pantheistic faith. Matter, energy, and ether became for him the emanation of some divine spirit, and he taught his followers to worship them. The monistic idea of God, which alone is compatible with our present knowledge of nature, recognizes the divine spirit in all things. God is everywhere. Every atom is animated, and so is the ether. Thus, Haeckel presented the universe to his followers as a colossal organism bound together by a mobile cosmic ether, which by its universal diffusion created divinity and linked each individual to the divine cosmos. Ever more irresistibly, it is more it is born upon born in upon us that even the human soul is but an insignificant part of the all-embracing world soul, just as the human body is only a small fraction of the great organized physical world. So does this remind people of anything? Does this you know what comes to mind for me when I hear this? This world soul? Have you guys ever heard of the Gaia hypothesis? sounds just like the guy hypothesis that was something that um a man named james Lump lovelock who's a a, a british <laughs> mi6 agent or cia i think british i think he was the mi6 agent but um he basically uh created this idea of the guy hypo hypothesis um so it's it's interesting to see these ideas and Again, seeing their roots in uh, a lot of it and being ro rooted in Haeckelian ideology. Um, so Haeckel transitions us into another figure. So Haeckel's description of the soul quality of nature sounded completely theosophical. In fact, Haeckel was one of the major intellectual mentors of Germany's leading theosophist, Rudolf Steiner. In the 1980s, in the 1890s, uh, both Steiner and Haeckel corresponded with one another and both wrote that they shared a common basic outlook on the natural on the nature of the world. So um Steiner is a very interesting character. He was um Rudolf Steiner, born in 1861, uh lived to 1925. He was an Austrian occultist, uh, a social reformer, an architect, an esotericist and claimed to be a clairvoyant. Uh, if you've ever tried to read any of his books, they're insane. <laughs> his teachings are insane. Um, but he he founded something called Anthroposophy, which was an offshoot of Theosophy. He was a student of uh, Helena Blavatsky, um, but he kind of created his own version of Theosophy um, with roots in uh, yep the idealist philosophy and Christian Gnosticism. So he weaves in a lot of Christianity into Christian themes um, into his and uh, anthroposophy. Uh, he was a major influence on um, a lot of Nazis, um, and he is his legacy lives on today, most notably in the Waldorf schools, which you probably have one in your neck of the woods, especially if you live in a liberal area, very popular with um, you know sort of liberal enclaves where people want to send their kids to alternative schools that are more creative and whatnot um and biodynamic farming which was an early form of organic organic farming i put organic in quotes heavy heavy air quotes <laughs> um so here you can see a book uh written by steiner called the initiation and initiation and its results you can see a very, very uh, theosophical. We've got a swastika on here. Crazy, um, crazy pagan like theosophical religious background. Um, very cult like, cult like stuff that we're dealing with with Rudolf Steiner. And just to, as a fun little uh, pop culture reference, ha has anybody seen the film called Midsommar? Uh, which came out in 2019. So it came out, gosh, like five years ago, I guess now. But um, a little a little Easter egg in the film is we we have uh, Ernst Haeckel's artwork on the main character's uh, 
bedroom apartment wall. And this film, the director openly says, uh, was based on anthroposophy, um, Rudolf Steiner's uh, anthroposophy. Um, and if we compare the movie posters, so we have Midsommar on the left. Um, this is kind of the iconic moment of the movie with this woman who's sort of losing her mind because she's been um, dragged into this pagan cult where people, all of her friends are, I don't want to spoil it for people, but you know, uh, there's lots of death, ritualistic death in this movie. Lots of weird unsettling things that happen in this movie. Um, and then we compare that to this film called Evigerwald, um, which is German for eternal forest, which is a Nazi propaganda film. Uh, the, the, um, the blurb on the cover of the film says the Nazi production of Evigerwald remains one of the most unique and beautiful motion pictures ever made. Um, I did actually watch this a little bit. I, I used to do uh, live streaming and I watched it a little bit with, with the audience and it's a crazy film. Uh, it's pretty easy to find on, on the internet. So check it out a little bit. Um, it's a bizarre film. It's black and white and they, they basically worship the trees. It's, it's, they worship the forest. They have very high opinion of the forest. And at the very end, they show, you know, all the, the swastikas and the the maypole and and the Nazi camps. It's it's just, it's a crazy propaganda film. Whoops. But uh, what's so interesting is how closely it mirrors uh, the aesthetic of this modern film, which people probably don't even make this connection. But but there it is. It's very clear when you see it. The dancing around the maypole and the worship of nature. Um. We can see how the, the, the Hegelian ideology has proliferated, right, through our culture. Um, so, yeah, Steiner's lasting legacy is with organic farming, um, of which is anthroposophy, pseudoscience cult, religion pioneered, uh, known as bi biodynamic farming. It is still around today and operates mainly as Demeter. Uh, it relies on rituals like filling a cow horn with dung and burying it to tap into cosmic forces. Um, it's crazy stuff. Um, crazy stuff that here's, a so they've been around a long time. This is the cover of their, of Demeter's magazine. It says monthly magazine for biodynamic farming on April 20th, the leader, uh, Hitler, who is featured here on the cover, um, celebrated his 50th birthday. So we could see very much in line with the Nazis, although they will say that you know, they were rejected later by the Nazis, this and that, try to cover up their tracks a bit, but they, they're still in operation today. This is uh, the, the Biodynamic Federation Demeter International. This is their current uh, Facebook page. Uh, it's the same one. You can see it says Biodynamics. It's 1924. And uh, just within the last few years, they had this controversy where they put out um, a calendar with crop circles in their cattle in their 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 marketing material which had a sonoran the the a symbol of uh of nazism right um and of course they apologize this and that but very strange right a very strange thing to put out um considering uh modern context so um here's a an interesting slide that i grabbed from IFOM, I -F -O -A -M, which is basically the international body of uh, organic agriculture. So really a lot of this stuff trickles down into organic agriculture. Um, as they call it themselves, the first phase was initiated by their pioneers. So their pioneers, we have Rudolf Steiner here, um, Rachel Carson, um, Sir Albert Howard, La Lady Eve Balfour, who is interesting, right? Balfour. Do you guys recognize that name, Balfour? Um, you might recognize it, uh, especially with the news recently uh, with uh, with what's going on in Israel and, and Gaza. Um, the Balfour Declaration, right, was what kind of created the state of Israel um, through uh, a, a letter uh, written by Lord, Lord Balfour to the Rothschilds. Uh, I forget the history, but, but yes, this is the same, the same one. She, this is the niece of Lord, Lord Balfour was Lady Eve Balfour. 
who created the Soil Association, founded in 1946, um, along with Jorian Jenks, um, who was a close associate of Oswald, Mo uh, Oswald Mosley, who was the founder of the British Union of Fascists. And funnily enough, I couldn't find an actual picture of the guy, a good picture to put on the slide. The best thing I, I could find was this book cover, uh, Farming, Fascism, and Ecology. So I haven't read that, but it sounds fascinating. Um, the Life of Jorian Jenks. Um, here's a, a pamphlet put together by Jorian Jenks. Um, the Land and the People, British Union of Agricultural Policy by Jorian Jenks. And here on the back is a huge supporting advertisement for Oswald Mosley, a very famous fascist um, Nazi British guy. So very closely connected here. Not, not a huge leap, but we do make a little bit of a leap, um, you know, transitioning into the 1960s and 70s, uh, the, the same soil association. Um, that was started by Balfour and Jorian Jenks and all these Nazis. You could call the Blood and Soil Association, right? Um, it transitioned into more of a leftist, uh, more of a probably um, along the same lines, right, of the Congress for Cultural Freedom, where they kind of had to appeal to people who were saying, well, this is not, this is morally bankrupt. Um, so they kind of had to rebrand, right, and become a little bit more progressive seeming. So in comes uh, a very influential figure called E.F. Schumacher. Um, he became um, he became the president of the Soil Association. Um, he was a German who lived in England. Uh, he was a protege of of Keynes, John Maynard Keynes. Uh, he was a Rhodes Scholar. He's the author of a very famous book. I don't know how many of you have heard of this book, um, Small is Beautiful. Um, it, it's like famous, but not. I feel like if you've heard of it, you definitely know what it is, but some people haven't heard of it. It's a very influential book. And um, small plug, actually, Alex and I did a, a podcast episode, deep dive of this Small is Beautiful book. So check out our podcast on that to really go in depth on that topic. Um, but the important thing to take away from his book is that he advocated for something called appropriate technology uh, for developing countries. Um, he was vehemently opposed to nuclear energy and he promoted something called Buddhistic economics, which was basically uh, is one of the precursors to degrowth ideology, which says, oh, we should measure economics based off of human happiness, things like that. Kind of, kind of feel good nonsense uh, metrics that you can't actually measure uh, economy is based off of, but that sound really nice, right? Like, oh yeah, you know what? Happiness is more important than money. But um, a lot of these guys use that. To, they're uh, what what we would call sophists, right? Um, who kind of use that to as a thought termination. So with E. F. Schumacher, the interesting thing, and I, I read this book for for our podcast episode. So interesting to read these. If you can get your hands on these these little beach reader books that they just pumped out in the sixties and seventies to kind of infiltrate people's minds. Um, the very back of the book, it's so interesting. After you read this stuff, it says, well, if you want to take the next step, write to us, join, you know, join our movement, uh, become part of it. Um, and so of course he's got the soil association here listed in the middle. And he also has, um, something called the Intermediate Technology Development Group Limited. Now, that organization still exists to this day, and they've rebranded as something called Practical Action. And this is a screenshot of their current website over here. Um, you can see. Um, so Practical Action, the roots of our ethos, big change starts small. Schumacher and a group of his associates created an, an advisory center which aimed to promote the type of planet-friendly techniques Schumacher had written about. This advisory center centered was established in 1966 under the name Intermediate Technology Development Group and is known today as Practical Action. In the end, intermediate technology will be labor-intensive and will lend itself to use of small-scale establishments. 
The plan was to encourage a move away from a technical hardware approach and towards a development approach instead. This development approach opted to focus on helping communities facing poverty to help themselves rather than prescribing hardware-based solutions that may not be viable or appropriate. ITDG changed its name to Practical Action in 2005, building on the previously held beliefs carried by the organization to focus on pragmatic, holistic, and systemic approaches to tackling poverty. We still very much carry Schumacher's guiding principles with us to this day, using the idea of small is beautiful to inform our work as a global change-making group. So we can see how all of this ideology has trickled down into um, what we see today as giving Africans uh, and developing nations solar panels, which um, is a slap in the face, if you ask me. Um, because I think that Africans deserve to develop their countries the way the rest of the world did, which is through fossil fuel development, right? Nuclear and fossil fuel. Um, but there is an ideological um, sector that is hell-bent on keeping the developing world chained to labor-intensive, um, as they, they call it themselves, a labor-intensive economy of energy and production and agriculture. So, of course, you know, they have their, their solar panels and all their promotional material. Another um, influential figure within the uh, Soil Association was a man named Barry Commoner. Um, he was an early influence on what later became known as eco-socialism. So we'll see we'll see how that ties later into the eco-socialist movement. Um, he ran for president, and he was called the Paul Revere of ecology. So he was, I think, he was more famous um, in his time than E.F. Schumacher was, although I'd say that Schumacher's legacy is uh, quite a bit more influential than Barry Commoner. But Barry Commoner, he wrote a lot of books, um, one of them called The Poverty of Power, Energy and, and Economic Crisis. Um, and he wrote that the second law of thermodynamics is perhaps our most powerful scientific insight into how nature works. Now that 150 years have elapsed since the law was discovered, it is perhaps time that we should begin using it to govern the ways in which energy is employed. To penetrate the chaos that surrounds the subject of energy, there is one essential, if difficult, tool available to us, the science of thermodynamics. The second law asserts a single cosmic fact, that the universe is constantly, irreversibly becoming less ordered than it was. Whatever happens in the world leads in this downhill direction. The second law also tells us that such a natural process can be reversed by the application of energy, but as we shall see, this can only be accomplished only at the expense of further decay in the overall order of the world. What people do then is to use energy to reverse in highly specific localized ways the overall decay of the universe towards disorder, increased probability, and loss of information. We cannot, of course, change the fate of the universe. Overall, the spontaneous downhill process continues. Now, that is depressing as hell to me. I mean, but this is what all of this stuff is based off of this idea of the second law of thermodynamics which is the law of entropy, um, which may be relevant for a steam engine, which is where it was basically discovered, but it does not apply to our entire universe. Um, it may be true for closed systems, but our universe, there's no proof whatsoever that our universe is a closed system. But this is the foundational uh ideology uh, that underpins all of this stuff about you know e ecological civilizations and and um reducing our energy reducing our carbon footprint um small is beautiful uh using solar panels um is that we have this finite amount of energy that exists in the universe and that we have to parcel it out little by little so that 
future generations will still have enough and we can live on until the inevitable heat death of the universe. And this is, it's, it's nonsense. It's, it's not scientific. Um, it's, it's their ideology. It's, it's what underpins their theology. Um, and all of this is, is held up as, as the most important science, as as Barry Commoner calls it, the most important thing that we've discovered. And of course, Schumacher, uh, Barry Commoner, Paul Ehrlich, all of these influential figures of environmentalism that came out of the 1970s, 60s, and 70s, of course, all of them want to ignore nuclear energy. They all want to say, oh yeah, nuclear energy uh, exists outside of these rules that we've created. But it, don't pay attention to that. It's too dangerous. It's not good. It creates waste. All of these talking points, which have later on been debunked, um, which is why we stopped developing um, our nuclear capacity. So um, here's Barry Commoner and what he had to say about Marxism. As an explanation of why Marx's prediction failed to materialize, that is until now, emerges from the improved understanding of economic process processes that is one product of the recent concern with the environment. One of the questions that arose as the enormous extent of the environmental pollution generated by modern production technology became clearer was why this obviously harmful process could be allowed to happen. In, in answer, it was pointed out that pollution is external to the operation of the marketplace transactions and that su that uh, that govern a capitalist economy in such a transaction um, a, in such a transaction an exchange takes place a mutually beneficial transfer of commodities undertaken uh, voluntarily between the parties but pollution is neither voluntary nor mutually beneficial as a result the marketplace exchanges exchange takes no account of it and there is no way of charging the cost of pollution to any party in the exchange. Since no one has to pay for it, there is nothing to keep pollution from happening. And as we now well know, the cost is borne by society as a whole. Oops. A business enterprise that pollutes the environment is therefore subsidized by society. To this extent, the enterprise, though free, is not wholly private. So here we see the beginnings of eco-socialism, right? It was this idea that Marx failed to consider uh, pollution as part of the economic, um, as part of his economic equation of la the labor theory of value. Okay, Marx didn't consider pollution. And what, what we see here are the roots of what we see now today is, I don't know, what do you guys think of? A carbon tax, perhaps, right? It sounds like, like Barry Commoner is referring to what might now be called a carbon tax. Okay, we're going to we're going to tax people for polluting the environment or the EPA, right? Uh we're going to tax we're going to bring the economics of pollution into the equation, which was never anything that that Marx ever dealt with because it was nobody considered this as part of the economic equation in Marx's time. These were people taking on um, a new definition and building on what they thought was Marxism. So that sort of concludes the 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 monist, the the Hegelian lineage of of anti Christianity, um, anti humanism, um, monism, and now we're gonna rewind a little bit because if Hegel wanted to kill Christianity, then Alfred North Whitehead was part of the lineage that wanted to rebrand it. Um, and uh, I think Matt talks a lot about Alfred North Whitehead. I'm not going to talk about him too much, but he's important um, just for a few reasons because he leads into our next character. But so Alfred North Whitehead, he was born in 1861 um, he sort of reverses Plato's forms, the form and, you know, the, the, the physical world. He thinks that the physical world is the, is the perfect thing. And that's his, what he calls process philosophy. He innovated this thing called process philosophy, 
which basically says that everything is a process, that nothing is, everything is just constantly in motion. Nothing, it just is, everything is just a process in motion. Uh, he wrote a book uh, called Princi uh, Principia Mathematica with his student Bertrand Russell. Um, and you pretty much need psychedelic drugs to understand his process philosophy because it's 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 one of those things that people come up with when they're really, really high and they say, well, the tree is moving and it's a process. And yeah, it's weird. It's very strange. But the important thing about Whitehead is a student of his, you could say, a man named John B. Cobb, um, born in 1925, is still alive today. John B. Cobb is still alive today. Um, Cobb is often regarded as the preeminent scholar in the field of process philosophy and process theology, the school of thought associated with the philosophy of Alfred North Whitehead. Um, and here's his book. He's written tons of books, but here's one of them. Is it too late? A theology of ecology, which we'll get more into. So um, eco, there's a thing called eco theology and uh, the ecological complaint. So major figures in the, the movement of eco theology were characters like Pierre, uh, Pierre Te Tehard de Chardin and John B. Cobb, who we're talking about today. Um, the signature Christian teaching in this respect was uh, the theology of human dominion over nature, um, also called stewardship, a theology that encouraged manipulation, even exploitation of nature for the sake of human purposes. According to these scholars and critics, Christianity is unavoidably anthropocentric, no longer relevant to the ecological world, ecology, ecological world, and even in a sense, uh, spiritually dangerous. Darwinism put pressure on theology and the anthropocentric Christian view. Um, in, in the 1960s and 70s, emerging of Christianity with ecology became popular. So um, with Haeckel, we saw sort of the believe science people who say, if we, we're not religious, we just believe in science. Now, here's the, the people who still want to remain sort of Christian, um, but want to merge it with this new ecological Hegelian perspective, right? Um, so John B. Cobb, the vision of eco-theology. So the late 20th century, eco-theologians can be said to have shared a single vision rooted in early modern theologies of nature. Characteristically, they championed the idea of a divine eminence in the whole cosmos, a relation, uh, e a relational, ecological, rather than hierarchical understanding of God, humans, and the created world, a radically reinterpreted, reinterpreted view of human dominion over nature. And I, I highlighted that because I think that's the most important thing to take away um, in terms of partnership with nature and uh, a commitment to justice for all creatures, not just humans, highlighting the needs of the impoverished masses and endangered species. Um, so that's where this idea, and people have probably seen this before, this idea that ego on the, on the left-hand side is this pyramid where humans are at the top and they're dominating over nature. And that's bad. That's the old way. That's anthropocentric. That's bad. We need to move towards an eco, uh, ecocentrist worldview where everyone is, is equal and the rocks and the fishes and the, the whales and the jellyfish should be considered equally with human beings. This is sort of the major paradigm shift. Um, and this, we can see sort of the end point, the, the, the rational conclusion of some ideology like this is uh, manifest in somebody like Peter Singer. Um, Peter Singer is uh, famous for his book called Animal Liberation. Um, he's a moral philosopher, ethicist, moral ethicist, um, who believes that all animals are should be considered equal um, he's a hedonist. Um, he thinks that um, we should judge what is good and right based on how much pleasure or pain a sentient 
being can get out of something. And that should be the guiding principle um, of how we run the world is how much pleasure or pain, um, how much censorious uh, feedback we get from, from a certain thing that, that should dictate how we make rules and run our societies. Um, while I was doing pulling together images for this presentation, I, I saw that he did a reboot recently, Animal Liberation Now. So Animal Liberation was a huge, huge book back in 1975 that he wrote. I guess he rebooted it. And I think this is a this is like a fun little Easter egg for people who probably watch this channel a lot. The, uh, that there was a new introduction to his book written by uh, Noah uh, Yuval, Yuval Noah Harari which is hilarious to me. It's like a hilarious ir irony that, that Harari wrote this. Um, it makes total sense, right? Harari is a complete world economic Malthusian ghoul. And um, I'm going to play a short clip for you guys just to show you what Peter Singer's ideology, which this anthropocentric, anti-anthropocentric worldview takes us to a natural conclusion of which is very, very dangerous thinking. Um, this is a clip from a film that I made in 2021 called um, Consumerism, Can We Buy a Better World? So watch this quick clip here. And he's being, he's being interviewed by uh, some podcast uh, person and he's asking him a few, a few questions, but you'll see. Let been me the give various... you a hypothetical to maximize the greatest level of happiness and minimize the the least amount of suffering on our planet Earth. We it has to exterminate the human race. <laughs> then, are we to? Yeah, I um, mean, you know, if we got those calculations right, if we're assuming that that was in fact uh, the best thing in the long run um, for everyone. Um... Well, just like. You say in effective altruism that let's say a dollar spent in Asia or in Africa is a lot better spent because it goes a lot further away than a dollar spent, let's say, in Canada or in the United States. They would say, well, if we put all those effort in all those other species, uh, as opposed to the humans, the, the planet would be much better off because, look, they've run the planet for the last, let's say, a few thousand years, and it's pretty much a disaster. Species extinction, mass extinction, environmental collapse, ecosystems are collapsing. You know, oceans are acidification, pollution with plastic materials, climate change, you name it. So they haven't done very good job, and it's just not worth worthy. <laughs> let's say effective altruism from the planetary point of view would mean that just like you favor investing in in the third world rather than let's say the, the people who need it in canada and in the us they say likewise only with other species against humanity not that easy to uh, believe that, that that would be the case but but if it is then okay i mean if they've got the calculations right and that is the better outcome um, as i said i'm not i'm not wedded to the existence of any particular species so would you resist any such uh, uh, sort of solution? And would it be ethically wrong to resist? I think it probably would be ethically wrong to resist it. Yes, I think if in fact this um, super intelligence uh, correctly judged that we humans are the cause of so much suffering in the world and so much wrongdoing um, and uh, need to be exterminated, I think it would be a mistake to say, well, I'm human, so somehow I have to defend all human beings. <laughs> so we just walk to the slaughter voluntarily? Uh, if in fact that is the correct solution to all the problems, yes. And yes, we ought to, we ought to get rid of ourselves. We ought to uh, take, take the drugs so that we just you know, gently slip into uh, death and, and wipe ourselves out. And then I think we should do that. You know, I've been vegan now for a little over two years. So that, that was a short, uh, short clip from the documentary that I made. Um, so we could see where, where this ends up, right? Even, even the interviewer laughs because he can't believe he got Peter Singer to say, yeah, we should 
you know, if 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 the super intelligence decides that human beings should just, you know, wipe ourselves out because we're no better than any other species. That's where this type of ideology leads us down a, a very destructive path, right? So, um, so John Cobb is an interesting fellow, right? He understands the need for religion in society. He understands the, the, the relevance of Christianity, things like that. But he's open to all kinds of spirituality, including hedonism, paganism, etc. So I'm going to read a little bit from his book, uh, Is It Too Late? A Theology of Ecology. Cobb writes, earlier generations stressed the tension between science and Christian theology, often to discredit Christianity. They thought of science as a product of reason free from religious faith, or they attributed it to Greek influence in the Renaissance, but more careful consideration from a less prejudiced point of view shows that the development of science in the West began in the high Middle Ages. It was continuous with the rest of the cultural activity and conviction of the time. And this was a profoundly this was profoundly shaped by Christianity. The minds of the scientists were certainly free, but so were those of the philosophers and the theologians of this period. Science can flourish when people believe that that behind the apparent randomness or will, willfulness of phenomena, there is an enduring order to be discovered. The understanding of reality as cosmos enabled the Greeks to make a brilliant start in the development of science. On the, but on the whole, they preferred rational deductions to painstaking investigation of the facts. Now, I mean, I, I think he's saying a lot of truthful things here. I think he, he understands the role that religion plays in progressing uh, society. But he continues, but it was the Western Christian view of nature as the creation of an intelligent uh, will that provided the context and motivation for the sustained and patient effort divorced from all consideration of practical results that carried Western European science from its infancy in the Middle Ages to the amazing achievements of the 17th century. Because nature was seen as God's creation, one knew that it embodied rational and intelligible order. Furthermore, the discovery of that order was of supreme value since it led to knowledge of God himself. Aspects of Christian belief have thus been responsible for Western European advances in both technology and science, whereas that might have sounded like boasting a short time ago, in the light of our present problems, it has the ring of confession. So he's saying this is a bad thing. In this connection, there is still another aspect, a basic aspect of Christian belief that has played its role in bringing history to its present pass. The Judeo-Christian tradition has deeply implanted in the Western psyche the idea that every human individual is of absolute value. I think that's a good thing. Vast efforts have been expended to keep alive human beings whether or not they are able to make a contribution to society. That statement stands out to me and I, I bolded it because that's true. Every human being is able to make a contribution to society. But clearly, the way he's stating it, he does not believe that. Um, John B. Cobb does not believe every human being can contribute to society. Uh, he apparently thinks some people are a drag on society. A large portion of scientific and technological advancement has been successfully directed towards the conquest of disease and the prolongation of life. The westernization of the globe in, in this respect has played a major role in the vast increase in worldwide population in the last 50 years. The West sounds pretty anti-Malthusian to me. Uh, when this high appraisal of the value of human individual is brought together as it has been in Western Christianity with the view that humans are called to dominate the non-human world, this world is still further reduced in value. Indeed, it has been denied any value in itself. Its value lies entirely in its usefulness to people. Only human beings have intrinsic worth. The value of the non-human world is purely instrumental. So we can we can read here where John John B. Cobb takes umbrage to Western Christianity as he is not down with the anthropocentric worldview um, that human beings are uh, superior life forms to other forms of life, um, and that using the world and 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 organizing the world in such a way um, to prevent us from dying, uh, living longer lives, living better lives 
is not a good thing, right? Um, according to John Cobb, because that leads us to devalue the non-human world. That's his justification. Um, so Cobb goes on to talk about things like hair, the the uh, the the musical hair. So he says, largely in relax reaction to secular atheism. There is arising now a fresh and vital paganism. So this was written, you know, right around the same time in the mid mid to late 20th century. So people are rediscovering the sacred in the dance, in the communal intimacy, and in the mysteries of bodily feeling. The popular musical Hair celebrates this new tribalism with evangelical fever. The new pagans are irre uh, irreverent towards the traditional Christian and humanistic symbols of the sacred. They are not concerned with displaying the sacred as either unified or transcendent. They're satisfied in the immediacy of the experience of the sacred power. They call on us to regain the lost awareness of the sacred in all the varied experiences of life. Then we will stop treating these experiences as pragmatic means to some future or transcendent God and enjoy them as ends in of themselves. Not theories about the universe, but the concentration of energy and feeling in the now is the proper expression of this renewal of religious experience. In general, the new paganism, like the old, is far more in tune with the vitalities and rhythms of nature than our traditional Christianity humanism and secular atheism. This sacred is found not only in human community and bodily ecstasy, but in the natural environment as well. The healing of human individuals and society is regarded as requiring a new balance and harmony with the non-human world. People must find themselves in and with the natural processes rather than outside and against them. Those human feelings that, ar that rise directly out of the organism are trusted more than those that have been culturally molded. So I think Cobb is, uh, he's pretty open to paganism. He's pretty open to um, treating human beings like animals um, that are just censorious creatures that should just be judged. Um, their value should be judged on how much pleasure they can acquire while they're living and breathing and that nothing else really matters because we're just part of the, the, the larger Gaia organism. We're just cells in a body, right? We're not... We're not important as individuals. We're just part of the the Borg. <laughs> Sounds like he's a lot more compatible with paganism than he is with Christianity. So here's where Cobb starts to intersect um, with China. So in a speech Cobb delivered, John B. Cobb delivered um, at a conference of Chinese delegates at the Claremont School of Theology in 2010, I'm going to read some of his speech Buckle up because there's some crazy stuff in here. So John B. Cobb lays out three requirements for his ecological civilization. The first requirement um, is for a nation to move far in the direction of ecological civilization uh, is cultural or spiritual. People are not likely to treat nature with the necessary respect if they do not deeply feel that they are part of it. In this regard, the remnants of indigenous cultures point the way but none of them are in, in position to lead a contemporary nation. Go figure. As hunting and gathering cultures gave, gave way to agricultural ones and then to urban-oriented ones, deep diversities emerged with respect to the relation of human beings to the encompassing world. The separation went furthest in Western Europe, climaxing in what we call the Enlightenment and modernity. Chinese civilization, on the other hand, retains something of the ancient feel for participation and belonging in the natural world. His second requirement, I'm just going to paraphrase, he just says basically care about poor people. Pretty agreeable thing. And then his third requirement, third prerequisite for moving toward ecological civilization is control of population. There is no way that an ecological civilization can be established without an exploding population. The population must be stabilized. Pretty Malthusian, if you ask me. So Cobb says, goes on in his speech to say, the need to produce more agricultural products with less water and arable land will tempt a modernizing China to engage in crash programs of high-tech farming that will prove radically unsustainable. This will make the achievements of an ecological civilization impossible 
China must not go the way of industrial agriculture. China should build on its great resource of skillful, hardworking peasants who can learn to be even more productive. This will be labor intensive form of this will be a labor intensive form of agriculture. And if China becomes an ecological civilization, it will owe this achievement most of all to the skilled farmers who learn how to produce more with less. A major ele element in envisioning such an agriculture will be a shift to, from an annual to a perennial grains now led by West Jackson of the Land Institute. An ecological civilization will greatly reduce its use of fossil fuels. Of course, this can be done by shifting to other forms of energy, but most of these also have problems. This is especially true of nuclear energy, go figure, which does not belong in an ecological civilization. Only passive solar energy seems to be completely free of such problems. The goal of ecological agriculture would be to meet all of its needs with passive solar energy. Paolo Solieri believes that if sufficient energy can be gathered from the industries at the base of the arcologies, uh, the, weight, the waste heat from these industries can meet the other needs of, for energy. The solar energy might be collected in vast greenhouses that would also be part of the labor intensive agriculture of the ecological civilization. So here's an example of a aerocology is what he calls it or arcology. So the, these like sci-fi sci looking things where everyone lives in this one structure that just builds up and up and up so you can preserve the land around it. Pretty crazy stuff. Very sci-fi. And that brings us to this part of the presentation um, where we explore, is ecological civilization a Western or a Chinese idea? So this is uh, from an article in 2022 um, from the Rachel Carson Center. Uh, we mentioned her earlier in the soil, the soil part, the organic soil part of the presentation. Um, but we have this author named Donald Worcester, Worcester, who writes, although the eco-civilization imaginary is originally Western in origin, China claims to have its own resources in philosophy, poetry, science, and technical skill, which can produce a new imaginary that is distinctively Chinese. Now, remember also that they are a Marxist. Uh, they, they, they have Marxist ideology. So perhaps, again, they are taking their own traditions and melding it with the ideas of Marxism. Maybe they're doing that with eco-civilization as well. Ironically though, the idea was first put forward by Western philosophers and critics, most of them living in Germany and the United States. One point of beginnings was Oswald Spengler's The Decline of the West, published in 1918 and 1922. Then there were the philosophers of the Frankfurt School and Neo-Marxism, which part of the cultural Congress of Cultural Freedom, founded in 1923, including such figures as Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno, part of the Co Congress of Cultural Freedom. Also, one should include one of the 20th century's most influential thinkers, Martin Heidegger and his students, particularly Hans Jonas, Herbert Marcuse, and Hannah Arendt, the so-called Heidegger's children, all of whom ended up living as expatriates in the United States. Then there were American-born writers such as Robert Heilbronner, Louis Mumford, Murray Bookchin, and even the conservationists Rachel Carson and Aldo Leopold, all of them active from the 1930s on. Diverse they certainly were, but they were bound together by growing anxiety over where the world, and particularly modern experience, modernity experienced in Europe and the U.S., was heading. They feared that this that civilization was caught up in a whirlwind of technology, which would dehumanize people and poison the earth. Two world wars, the atomic bomb, the invention of airplanes and automobiles, exploding populations, climate change, and signs of planetary, not just national degradation, made them increasingly fearful of the future. They attracted thousands of followers on both sides of the Atlantic. And by the 1960s, those followers formed a counterculture to supersede both co communism and capitalism, which were seen as part of a common technological civilization. The enemy was identified as the machine, the techno-social apparatus built by the human brain to satisfy human urges and appetites. 
Germany under the Nazis exemplified the machine. The technological civilization, however, was understood to be globalizing in scope, making all peoples in the earth alike sick. While never organized into a coherent political movement, this counterculture fought against modernity and turned instead to environmentalism and Green Party politics. Among those opposed to the machine was Iring Fetcher, a reform-minded Marxist, um, also a former Nazi soldier, according to his Wikipedia page, uh, in Germany's Frankfurt School. Uh, Fetcher's book, Uber Len Ben Den Bedningsgungen dem Menschheit, <laughs> I tried, guys, I tried, was published in 1976, and it was he who first coined the phrase ecological civilization. We must abandon our faith in the machines, he urged, in economic growth and in reductive, immense instrumentalized thinking about people and nature. Unlike Karl Marx, who was concerned primarily with rescuing the human proletariat, Fetcher wanted to save both humanity and nature. The most provocative of the internationalist, countercultural, anti-technological thinkers was Hans Jonas. He taught philosophy from 1955 to 1976 at the New School for Social, Social Research in New York City. Jonas's most important book, The Phenomenon of Life, is a densely argued treatise on ontology, which deals with the core ideas of biology and their importance to the humanities. Jonas wanted to break down not merely social hierarchies, but also the root hierarchy at the west, heart of Western civilization, the ontolog ontological dualism of humans over nature. So here, again, we are seeing dualism versus monism. That dualism that had made a sharp moral distinction between homo sapiens and other forms of life and from that act of separation, Jonas believed, stemmed all environmental abuse and degradation, all the tyranny and conquest, tyranny and conquest, and all the enslavement of species and human beings. The brain had become not an equal counterbalancing partner within the human organism, checking the more selfish passions, but a mere subordinate instrument serving the urgencies of power and appetite. Now, take a look at his book cover too. Does this book cover make you guys think of anything does it look like anything um yeah yeah right it it looks like a haeckel illustration or like uh alex when i asked alex a question he said it looked like uh covid <laughs> which is another interesting connection um but moving on so here um here's dr john cobb dr john b cobb and uh his his students or, you know, two people who promote his ideas, um, who we're going to hear from. Uh, Mei Jun Fang, she's uh, Mei Jun Fan, she's on the right. And Dr. Jihee Wang, who's on the, I'm sorry, she's on the, she's on the uh, left. And Jihee Wang on the right hand side. And we're going to be hearing from them. Um, so first we'll hear from Jihee Wang um, in monthly review. Um, who writes, as with many other Western intellectual movements, such as constructive postmodernism based on white Hedian philosophy, an intellectual movement which originated in the West but now has considerable influence in China, the beginning of ecological Marxism in China can be called the period of introduction or the transmission of Western ideas to be followed eventually by their critical absor absorption and transformation in a Chinese context. During the period of introduction, the following four theories from many among Western ideas, schools, and representatives, figures of ecological Marxism, have attracted the attention of Chinese Marxists. So I, sk I skipped, there's a couple of them, but I want to focus today on the theories of John Bellamy Foster and Paul Burkett on Marx's ecology. According to many Chinese Marxists, all three of the preceding theories acknowledge that Marx Marxist theory can provide a guide for solving the ecological crisis of capitalism, but none of them publicly acknowledge, or for that matter, denies that Marxism, including Marx himself, provided provided the basis for an ecological worldview. It is Foster and Burkett who commenced to construct Marx's ecology, 
which gives ecological Marxism a great, much greater theoretical value in dealing with the contemporary ecological crisis. Foster finds Marx's ecology in his theory of metabolism, while Burkett finds it in Marx's theory of value of labor value. So basically what they're saying is that these two guys pioneered the idea that Marxism is compatible with ecology. Um, so here's just a short timeline um, of the term. So the term ecological Marxism was first coined um, by a guy named Ben Agar um, in his book, Western Marxism, an introduction to classical and contemporary sources in 1986. Ecological Marxism is first introduced to China um, by 1995. Um, David Ray Griffin, who coined the term constructive postmodern, um, has a book that is translated into Chinese. Um, and then things start to speed up. In 2004, um, we see Foster's book uh, on Marx's ecological thought is published um, in China. Foster's book, Ecology Against Capitalism, is published in China. Um, then we have the Claremont Forum on Ecological Civilization. Uh, the Chinese, in 2007, the Chinese government first proposes to build an ecological civilization. Um, and then by 2010, uh, ecological Marxism gains popularity. Uh, John B. Cobb delivers a speech, uh, which I read earlier. By 2012, ecological civilization is written into the Chinese constitution. And then in 2013, Xi Jinping is elected president, who, and he is the current president of China. And a lot of people say, think that, that uh, ecological civilization is a Chinese idea. Um, not really, though. So here we have John Bellamy Foster, who is the editor of Monthly Review, which is uh, found, it was a, it's a publication founded in 1949. It is the longest continuously published socialist magazine in the United States. Um, John Bellamy Foster revised Marxism to include the idea of metabolic rift. Um, and he began his career as an environmentalist and later became a Marxist, but he's, an, he's a lifelong environmentalist. So the last clip I'll show for today is Foster basically explaining how he turned Marxism, how he transformed Marxism. So um, he basically says all of it out loud. So this is really important to watch and we'll get some perspective on what has happened. The 1980s, especially the late 1980s, remember Gorbachev had come into power in the Soviet oh. Union uh, Chernobyl in, in uh, 1986, and it, it became uh, the general notion that Marxism was anti-environmental and uh, that it was Promethean and that Marx himself was a Promethean and anti-ecological thinker in many ways. This, this became the prominent view even among the left. And then um, even more prominent in many ways, at least initially, was Ted Benton's Marxism and Natural Limits, which came out in 1989 in New Left Review, same year as the fall of Berlin Wall. And uh, it um, argued that Marx in many ways was, was inferior to Malthus from an ecological perspective, because while well, Malthus had dealt with natural limits, Marx had not, and that Marx was a Promethean thinker. And what was happening at this time is that eco-socialism arose to prominence in the late 1980s in a view that, uh, a view that distanced itself from Marx. The general view was, well, we had to create a, a, a red-green perspective that was somewhat eclectic because the argument was that what Marx had offered was, was an analysis of labor, but that we had to take our notion of ecology from the mainstream green movement and then um, uh, merge the two together in a sort of hybrid fashion. And some of us started to look 
back at, at Marx's own work. And uh, I, I did, um, in the mid 1980s, I was asked to write a piece for a German dictionary and lo started looking back to uh, the deep structure of Marx's analysis uh, with respect to materialism and ecology. And um, in 1999, uh, Paul Burkett wrote Marx and Nature, which explained that that ecology and nature was really integrated into Marx's value theory uh, in, in quite a uh, quite definitive work. And, and Burkett and I had been working together. We were both on the board of Capitalism, Nature, Socialism. And uh, in that same year, I wrote um, my article, Marx's Theory of Metabolic Rift. And um, I had decided it arose out of his materialism and that Marxists had lost sight of what Mar materialism actually meant for Marx. So this uh, created what we call um, second stage or, or second generation eco-socialism. So we can hear um, John Bellamy Foster directly says that he just decided that the Marxism was meant to be compatible with ecology, um, despite evidence to the contrary. That these folks, so he refers to uh, Ted Benton, who wrote in New Left Review, also something that came out of the Congress of Cultural Freedom in 1989. Um, Benton writes, finally, I shall return briefly to the exgenesis of Marx and Engels on these questions. A productivist Promethean view of history is widely attributed to them. While I remain to ecological critique of their work, it is also necessary to recognize the basis for another quite different reading in which they their explicit or tacit acknowledgement of some of these ecological arguments may be emphasized. Now, keep in mind, as we as we learned before, ecology was an emerging idea in Marx's time. Ecology didn't even take root as a legitimate science until well after World War II. So there's no way that they these guys would have been like thinking of it as some sort of respected um, school of thought. Uh, what these guys are doing is transposing their own ideas um, and their own respect for the school of thought that is like ecology and reading it back into Marxism, despite them being actually pretty vocally opposed to some of the underpinning ideas of ecology. Um, so he writes, Marx and uh, both Engels and Marx do also have ways of characterizing the future society, which deliberately avoid the triumphalism and the utopianism of the productivist account. One very striking example is also provided by Engels. So Engels writes, thus at every step, we are reminded that we by no means rule over nature like a conqueror over foreign people, like someone standing outside of nature, but that we with flesh, blood, and brain belong to nature and exist in its midst, and that all our mastering of its of it consists of the fact that we have the advantage over other beings of being able to know and correctly apply its laws, which I find to be a very agreeable uh, sentiment, that we alone as human beings know how to apply natural apply the natural laws um but he see but someone like ted benton sees this as um supporting his argument um again the following passage from marx is easily read as conf uh, confirming the promethean view of a historical struggle to subdue and control the forces of nature uh, with his development uh, this realm of physical necessity expands as a result of his wants, but at the same time, the forces of production, which satisfy these wants, also increase. Freedom in this field can only consist of unsocialized man. The associated producers, rationally regulating their interchange with nature, bringing it under their common control instead of being ruled by it as a blind power. But, writes Benton, if we read this passage as postulating not the bringing of nature under common control, but rather interchange with nature, then it is quite consistent with the idea of a form of interaction with nature, which integrates ecological self-regulation within its in uh, intentional structure. So it's a very flimsy argument that these guys are bringing forth um, about Marx and Engels being in favor of their ideology. Um, Here's another example of Foster and Paul Burkett writing about 
uh, Engels, who took great umbrage with the second law of thermodynamics. Um, they write, ever since Nicolas Georgescu Rogan, who is a big influence on the degrowth movement, uh, wrote his magnum opus, The Entropy Law and the Economic Process. The Entropy Law, or Second Law of Thermodynamics, has been viewed as essential to ecological economics. Some leading uh, ecological economists have gone to extraordinary lengths to separate at birth the Marxian and ecological critiques, and then to deny any direct relationship through a series of disconnects. A, Marx and Engels' own integration of thermodynamic concepts into their analysis is simply ignored. B, circumstantial evidence is offered to suggest that Marx and Engels actively rejected some of the crucial discoveries in thermodynamics in their day. C, it is alleged that Engels went so far as to cast doubt on the entropy law itself. And D, the fact that the early developments in ecological economics occupy the same intellectual universe as Marxism is downplayed, if not deliberately obfuscated. So these guys think it's a conspiracy theory. Um, they go on to say that the implication is that dialectics of nature associated with his classical historical materialism, and especially with Engels, is itself thrown into doubt by Engels' so supposed re rejection of the entropy law. More important, however, is the contention that by alleging, allegedly scorning the second law of thermodynamics, Engels, and by implication Marx, severed any possible connection between classical Marxism and ecological economics. Ben Said defended some of Engels' contributions to e ecological economics while contending that Engels was led astray by cosmological speculations on the heat death of the universe, which produced conclusions that were more ideological than scientific. He contended that the law of entropy seemed to Engels manifestly to breach through a breach through which religion could make a return. So Engels writes, in Germany, the conversation of natural forces, for instance, heat into mechanical energy, has given rise to a very absurd theory that the world is becoming steadily colder and the world is becoming or, and that the and that the temperature of the universe is leveling down, and that in the end, a moment will come when all life will be impossible and the entire world will consist of frozen spheres rotating round one another. I am simply waiting for the moment when the clerics seize upon this theory as the last word in materialism. It is impossible to imagine anything more stupid. Since according to this theory, in the existing world, more heat must always be converted into other energy than can be obtained by converting other energy into heat. So the original hot state out of which, everything, which things have cooled is obviously inexplicable, even contradictory, and thus presumes a god. Now, this is a, an atheist argument against um, this very ideological, anti-scientific idea. Newton's first impulse is uh, thus converted into a first heating. Nevertheless, the theory is regarded as the finest and highest perfection of materialism. These gentlemen prefer to construct a world that begins in nonsense and ends in nonsense. Instead of regarding these nonsensical consequences as proof, that what they call natural law is to date only half known to them. But this theory is all the dreadful rage in Germany. So say what you will about Marx and Engels, but I don't think that they liked the entropy law. I don't think that they, um, you know, there, there's some, the, some credit is due here where they did actually uh, speak out against these things, which they're now um, these sophists like, uh, John Bellamy Foster and John Cobb have basically revised history to include uh, these ideas, which they outright rejected. By 1991, German sociologist Rainier Grundmann was able to make the rather sweeping observation that Orthodox Marxism has vanished from the scene. Leftism, leftism has turned green and Marxists have become ecologists. So now we know how this, how orthodox Marxism that was pro-labor, pro-industry, pro-development, anti-Malthusian, pro-humanity, became this, Marx and the Anthropocene, degrowth communism. This is, you know, there's a lot here, but it's, you know, I, I tried to condense it to the most important things about 
how we get Marxism as a philosophy that is pro-worker, which is now becoming something that's used to promote green ideology, green Malthusian ideology. Now, in this, this section, I'd like to just quickly run through some Chinese ideas, some, some perspectives from Chinese people who are resisting this idea of ecological civilization and organic Marxism. Um, because they, uh, you know, they're a Marxist Leninist nation and maybe not everyone there, but they're, they're run by a government that identifies as Marxist Leninist. So um, we should hear what they have to say about it, right? So this is um, from an article written uh, by Jihi Wang, who is defensive. This is one of the one of the people who is pro um, ecological civilization and organic Marxism. Um, but they, he has written openly about the criticism that these ideas have received. So he writes, organic Marxism, a new development in the history of Marxism, has elicited a scrutiny in China. Beyond merely being considered absurd, it has been accused of curbing China's development on the pretext of ecological motivations, weakening China's dominant ideology by introducing ideological competition, and enabling re religious infiltration by promoting Alfred North Whitehead's process philosophy and constructive postmodernism, postmodern philosophy, which are religious in nature. I agree. As a new theory, organic Marxism inevitably prompts attacks from some fundamentalist Marxists. In these attacks, organic Marxism was accused of the following offenses, enabling religious infiltration by promoting Whitehead's process philosophy and constructive postmodern philosophy, two, propagating process philosophy and theism by publishing articles and books in China, three, curbing China's development on the pretext of promoting ecological civilization. And four, weakening China's dominant ideology by propagandizing organic Marxism. So this, and this again is written by the same two people, um, acolytes of John B. Cobb, writing in, in John Bellamy Foster's monthly review, they wrote, um, deeply influenced by Western modernity, China has predominantly accepted anthropocentric worldview values, which regard human beings as totally different from the world of natural things, and accordingly treats the world of nature as a world of objects. The value of na natural things lies merely in being used for our purposes. So they're saying that China is guilty of the same thing that the West is guilty of, which is putting human beings above all other living creatures, which is usually seen as a Christian worldview. This worldview and its resulting values have infiltrated the mainstream ideology of modern China, both in Mao's period and Deng's reform period. For example, during Mao's regime, the lyrics of one of the most popular folk ballads included the lines, There is no jade emperor in heaven. There is no dragon king on earth. I am the jade emperor. I am the dragon king. Make way for me. You hills and mountains, I'm coming. So they accuse this of being too anthropocentric, taking away religion that kept the peasants in their place. They say, you know what? Screw these mystical uh, religions that are keeping us impoverished. I am here now. I Make way for me. I'm a person. Um, but they see this as too anthropocentric. Um they meaning these people who are very pro-ecological civilization. They go on to say, since Deng's reform period and reform and opening up period, an anthropocentric worldview and values have spread throughout China. And they say this is a bad thing. For Pan uh, Jai Zheng, a scientist and former general engineer in the Ministry of Water Resources and Power, Chinese people don't allow rivers to flow freely. We launch a grand water conservancy construction unprecedented in, in world history in order to march towards reforming and controlling nature despite all setbacks. In his eyes, what the Yangtze River delivers is coal and oil. He adds, if we follow, if we allow the river, the, if we allow the water of the three gorges to flow freely for 100 years, it is equal to the outflow of 50 million tons of coal and 2.5 tons of petroleum. To pan the Yangtze 
has only economic value. Its use lies merely in producing electricity for human beings. The river's irrigation of farmlands and woods, spiritual nourishment of the people, and beautification of the earth for thousands of years is totally irrelevant to him. So these people see it as a bad thing that China wants to develop and that they think actually the human use of nature is more important than nature in of itself. Um, these folks go on to uh, say things like um, helping the Chinese people revalue, revalue their own traditional ecological wisdom is something that needs that is important. They give the anecdote of um, besides ecological wisdom, China has a long history of environmental protection practices. It is one of few countries in the world which can be said to have a long history in drafting environmental protection laws and regulations. According to Han Feizi, a classical philosoph uh, philosophy book written at the end of the Warring States period, anyone who dumped trash on public roads received a cutoff, the loss of a finger as punishment, a common penalty that existed under the law of the Shang dynasty. That means China had enacted environmental protection laws relating to punishing reckless dumping of trash and solid waste as early as 3,000 years ago. This ecological wisdom and practice can constitute powerful support for ecological civilization in general and environmental protection laws in particular. So they think that cutting people's fingers off for uh, littering is great ecological wisdom and is a good thing and they want to bring it back. <laughs> Very strange. Um, they also have their, they're also promoting all kinds of um eco uh, sabotage as well so we see the same thing um, they're trying to push in china of promoting development um, for instance in late october more than a thousand of, of 2012 more than a thousand residents of nigbo in uh, Zhehang, uh, Zhejiang province uh, took to the streets protesting the local government's plans to expand a petrochemical plant this demonstration successfully forced the ningbo government to shelve the $8.9 billion planned project. This was not an isolated incident. According to BBC, protesters in other Chinese cities have been successful over the past year in halting industrial projects because of environmental concerns. So China has the Just Stop Oil type <laughs> NGOs just like we do in the West. So there have been people who have spoken out against John B. Cobb, people in China. Um, what's fun is you can actually go to Google Translate and type in the words organic Marxism, translate it to Chinese, then search the Chinese characters, the way it's written in Chinese, and you'll pull up all kinds of articles that are very, very critical of organic Marxism and John B. Cobb. One of them being uh, Yin Haiji, who writes scathingly and she's had interactions with Cobb as well um she's had some back and forth so she writes why can their attacks about uh why can there are articles talking about god blatantly curbing china's economic development and seriously distorting marxism be published in our academic journals what is even more infuriating is that these academic Brooks, in disguise, have gained huge benefits from China while opposing China. For example, Harbin Institute of Technology, where she works, uh, hires Clayton, as who works for Cobb, as chief academic advisor, and the salary is 100000 per month. Harbin Institute of Technology introduced Wang Jihi and Fan Meijun, who we mentioned earlier, uh, full-time according to the 100 Talent Introduction Pro Plan. The salary is the salary of second level professor. By the way, this is translated from Chinese, so it sounds a little, it, it might sound a little off. The salary is the salary of the second level professor, the post allowance of the second post, and the annual income of each person is more than 200,000 yuan. They can stay in the United States without having to work at, at Harbin Institute of Technology, just publish articles in the name of Harbin. Um, and in the past six years, they have earned more than 2 million yuan from Harbin Institute of Technology. 
They are taking the tax money of the Chinese people, but they are importing religion into China, curbing China's development and subverting China's ideology, which makes every patriotic person in the know very sad. So isn't this interesting that as a Marxist Leninist country, they're saying these guys are bringing in this fake ideology disguised as Christianity or, or disguised as Marxism. And they, it's their, it's their Christianity that's trying to subvert us and stop us from developing, <laughs> which is the same thing that we say about Marxism is trying to infiltrate our country and take away our Christian ideals and stop us from developing. So it's sort of this mirror image, right? She writes, uh, Yin Haiji also writes, uh, in September 2019, a poster that the School of Marxism at Pekin University inviting John B. Cobb from the United States to give a lecture on organic Marxism, ecological Marxism, and the construction of ecological civilization was widely circulated in WeChat moments. Next, news and pictures of the Central Institute of Socialism's invitation to give a lecture by John B. Cobb, as well as the feelings of many non pop party cadres and students who attended the lecture appeared in the Central Institute of Socialism website and were reprinted in many places. Many scholars are surprised by this. Is it possible that organic Marxism, which has been identified as fake Marxism by the propaganda department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China and must not be promoted or taught, will be resurrected with the support of the School of Marxism and Pekin University and the Central School of Socialism? Do our country's non-party cadres need to be taught by theologians? The way that religions that promote es uh, eschatology capture people's hearts is often to describe a terrible future or a terrible afterlife, then point out a way for people to escape from this terrible future. That is, listen to me and follow me. Organic Marxists with a Christian soul also basically guide people to obey God's will according to this logic. In order for people to accept Whitehead's organic holism and the relational God based on it, they often preach that ecological disaster has come, society will collapse, and the earth will be destroyed. I think that Yin Haiji has a very strong grasp on how much bullshit this is. <laughs> so I don't think that they're stupid in China. Here's another author who writes, uh, General Secretary Xi Jinping pointed out, we must pay close attention to and study the new results of foreign Marxist research, analyze and identify them, and we must neither adopt a blanket rejection attitude nor copy them wholesale scientifically study and judge various foreign social trends of thought is the mission and responsibility of Chinese Marxist researchers. The trend of thought of organic Marxism has attracted widespread attention in the academic world as quickly as possible because it is directly named Marxism. The intervention and promotion of Chinese scholars have strengthened the Chinese elements of organic Marxism, setting off an academic carnival and forming an organic Marxism craze. So I think it's clear that the Chinese people are cautious about, about this, this, what is clearly um, something coming from the West um, that is seeping its way in, calling itself Marxist. Um, and they're saying, you know what, let's be cautious about this. Let's not reject it outright, but let's you know, let's be cautious. So this is the last section. I'm almost done. In conclusion, where does this leave us as the West, as Americans, Canadians, Westerners, you know, where does this leave us? After, after all of this that we've learned today, um, and we revisit this theory, is China, is, is China an eco-Marxist Malthusian superpower? that is fundamentally different than the United States, that is going to take over the world with degrowth communism and ecological civilization. Does anyone think that's true? <laughs> it's hard to believe now, right? Um, other questions I'd like to think about, are we so different? 
does capitalism versus communism even matter? Um, is eco is eco Malthusian sentiment coming from the West, coming from China, or is it coming from somewhere else? Um, as as was brought up, uh, a lot of the supposed anthropocentric worldviews that are in China are accused of coming from the West as well. So is it really the West that is originating these ideas, um, whether it's Marxism, Malthusianism, ecology? Is this coming from the West? Is it coming from China? Or is it coming from something else? I think it's coming from something else. I don't think that that um, the West, it's it's the West's fault for cultivating this stuff. I think that we are host to a parasite, an oligarchical parasite that is cultivating these ideas and they're being expressed through our civilization and being incepted in trying to be incepted into places like they were successfully in the USSR um, and in China now um, because the powers that be see a uh, friendship between our nations, the U S China, Russia, the great humanitarian superpowers. They see that as a problem because if we were to unite together and see the common threads of human being, the value of, of human beings, which is the common thread throughout our civilizations, whether you call it Marxism, whether you call it capitalism, whether you call it communism, doesn't doesn't matter. In my opinion, those terms should be left in the 20th century because they're they're totally irrelevant now. They're totally irrelevant. People say China is communist, that's why it's bad, but their economy is working well because they're capitalists. It doesn't make any sense, and it frankly doesn't matter. What they're doing is good, and what they're doing is right. Because they're inc they're increasing their capacity for uh, population, for for economic growth, for development. They're exploring space. Uh, they're growing. They're they're progressing the human race even further. And classifying economies as capitalist or communist just get it just muddies the water. It m totally muddies the water. We have more in common than we than we don't. And what it boils down to is two competing worldviews. We have peace through development. We have industry, which is industry, growth, technology, interconnectedness, internationalism, which we saw in those USSR posters, uh, peace, disarmament, all these things where we're a global community that respects each other's national sovereignty and wants to build and wants to push the entire human race forward. Versus small is beautiful, deindustrialization, decarbonization, peasant farming, labor intensive peasant farming, degrowth, division, keeping everyone small, separate, divided, enemies, uh, saying, you know what, it's either us or them, you know, and only the strong survive, right? That that's what how they see the animal world. And that's how they see the human world as well. They see us all as part of the same ecological whole, you know, we're all one unit, one organism, and that human life doesn't matter. Um, it's these two competing worldviews. And, and I think that Americans naturally fall into the first bucket, as, do, as does China, as does Russia. And it doesn't matter. I mean, Russia is a perfect example now because they used to be communist and they're not anymore, but they're still fundamentally the same, right? They're still, they're still our brothers. They're still working towards peace development um, and, and pushing humanity in the right direction. So I talked an awful lot about Marxism today. And you might think that I'm a Marxist. I'm not a Marxist. <laughs> I am not a Marxist. I think that Marxism is one of those things where people, they get really hot and bothered about it. And, and I think that it puts way too, too much emphasis on it because really, um, I think that he had some interesting ideas 
and I've read about them. I've read Marxism and I think there's some interesting ideas there. And I think he had some compelling ideas, but he had some, some deep fatal flaws as well. I think materialism has some deep fatal flaws. Um, it's embrace of Darwinism. It's embrace of this idea that only material, that the material reality is what dominates, um, what dictates, uh, how the world develops, uh, which is not true. Um, we are taking part in the creation of our universe, which is very clear if you look at it from a logical perspective. Um, but this sort of, this is the way that, uh, this is what irritates Marxists is when you talk about that. They are very stuck on materialism and material development. And it is important. The material world is important. There are rules to how the material world develops. And Marx is, ha, did actually articulate a lot of those problems. Um, but ultimately, I think that uh, the American system uh, which was is not ca just capitalist. It's not socialist. It's not any of these things. It's not Marxist. I think the American system um, is a much better uh, theory of change, uh, uh, economic theory that Americans and Westerners can look to for inspiration, which is um, an organic form of uh, of thought that has come out of our civilization and isn't just something that's being um, you know, dictated to or, 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 or transmitted to us from some foreign entity, right? Um, so Marxism is is again, it's it's um, Marx and Engels. I'll give them credit for saying some of the right things and being against you know things like the second law of thermodynamics and Ernst Haeckel and some of the Darwinist ideology. But I think ultimately it doesn't, it is not able to effectively uh, critique Malthusianism because it doesn't recognize ultimately the, the theory of change does not pin itself on the quality of human beings that is outside of the material realm, which is our ability for thought and reason and to tap into the non-material world and and tap into certain truths uh which enable us to develop outside of our natural limits which we are not constrained by which is the underpinning theory of how malthusianism works is that malthusianism says uh just like every other animal at some point will outstrip our resources um that's never been true for human beings it's never been true, but Marxism doesn't have an effective way of combating that ideology, which is, I think, why it's been able to be absorbed into um, neo-Malthusianism as we see it today. Um, and a lot, I think, what we should look to a lot, uh, and a pioneer in in uh, in debunking uh, limits to growth. Um, and neo-Malthusianism and ecology is Lyndon LaRouche, um, who was a great American. Um, he passed away a few years ago, um, but he started as a Marxist. LaRouche was a Marxist in his early days, but he was actually in real time identifying how the left was becoming contr a controlled opposition for the deep state, basically. He basically identified um, the new left movement as being basically a covert CIA operation. And for this, the left has, to this day, sees him as a complete enemy, uh, as enemy number one. Um, and any association, this is why what's funny is like, I, I say, you know, I'm not a Marxist, but uh, a lot of people think I am because I'm, you know, open to the ideas of Marx, but they get mad at me. La Marxists, actual Marxists, they get mad at me because of my affiliation with LaRouche. And that's because LaRouche has been one of the few people who's been able to actually strike at the ideas of neo-Malthusianism and ecology. Um, 
he has a great quote in his book. Uh, there are no limits to growth, which is a, a great book. I recommend it. Um, if, and it, if at any point we halt technological progress, the society foolish enough to do so, do such a thing condemns itself to die. Now, and that, that is like something that is so true was so true that we should have taken more heat of at the time, um, towards the end of the 20th century, when degrowth was starting to roll out and we were deindustrializing, we're at a point now where we are so far beyond, we have to, we need we need technological innovation and progress or we will die. We're, we're at a, a, a make or break point here. So um, I was recently um, honored to be in this book <laughs> featured as an enemy. So the degrowth movement um, is out there. They're weirdos, but you know, they're, they're, they're a strong group of weirdos, right? They're, they're, um, they're a network of weirdos, but they're, but they, so one of them just put out this book that just went viral amongst them. Um, and I'm featured in this book and, uh, here I am holding up a picture of LaRouche, <laughs> which is funny as, um, and they, they took a couple of my tweets, one where I say degrowth is a Nazi policy, which do, do you, don't you guys agree with that after this presentation? Um, I said LaRouche was more communist than 99% of Western leftists that came out of the CIA new left cultural program, which started in the 1950s and still exists in full force today. I think that's very, a very true statement, right? Um, but they see me as a bad, they, this is evidence that I'm wrong. <laughs> um, what else? They call me a fake Marxist. Um, so that's, that's my ide identity, I suppose. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and this other uh, tweet that I put out about LaRouche, where he, LaRouche says, um, it is my responsibility to make possible a capitalist solution, not because I'm pro-capitalist, but because that is the only thing that can ensure the human race's survival. Therefore, I'm in the same position as Marx. So th this was a very early, you know, statement by LaRouche back, back when he was a young man. Um, and certainly his opinion on it evolved. And I think my opinion on it is, has evolved as well. Um, but I think he's been very pragmatic about recognizing that Marxism was one thing at one point. It was very pro-labor, pro-industry. But the CIA basically was able to transform that positive sentiment into something that was more um, aligned with what they were trying to do, which is destroy our nation, uh, destroy our relationship with Russia and China. Um, I know we're running long, so I won't go crazy reading all these or anything, but here's just a few other, uh, a few other slides from that book that I thought were so funny. There's two quotes from, uh, Victor Orban and Vladimir Putin sort of equating, I, I feel privileged to be equated with these people who have, are putting forth these policies that are very pro natalist, which course, the degrowth movement hates because, of course, they aren't Malthusian, but they are. Uh, they say they're not, but they are. Um, so in conclusion, um, LaRouche is gone, but his ideas live on uh, in things like the Schiller Institute, the, the Belt and Road Initiative that China is pushing, Space Commune, which is my organization with my partner, Alex, right here, the Rising Tide Foundation. Um, we're pro-Russia, pro-China, and pro-technology for the sake of human development. We believe in peace, love, beauty, and truth. Um, this is what America was founded on. Uh, we are in our darkest hour right now. We must return to our original American thesis and join China's Belt and Road Initiative. And that that's my presentation. I know it was long, so sorry. <laughs> it was so long. No, Fox, uh, that was that was unexpectedly great. I, I mean, I expected great, but I didn't expect this level of, of sophistication. And you tying together so many moving parts uh, in this multi act presentation. You know, that that's quite, quite and I, I appreciated really the uh, the irony as well of the pro development Chinese who are freaked out about. The, uh, <laughs> the, 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 they're, they're freaked out about, um, 
eco-Christianity infiltrating to destroy them and subvert their, their aspirations to develop. And then you have the, you know, pro-American Westerners who are nationalists, pro-development, who are freaked out about the eco-Marxism that has infiltrated their world. Um, and, and it's just, it's so ironic that, uh, that the, it's so difficult for people with a common view of essentially our common aspirations to survive, to avoid this, uh, this calamitous dark age, which certain forces that you illustrated quite well are pushing us into, are being duped into not fully appreciating how we have so much in common with each other on both sides of the Iron Curtain. So very, very excellent presentation. I'm going to be sharing this far and wide. And as you can imagine, there are some uh, people who have questions for you. And the first person to get in is John Place. John, are you still there? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm in a cafe that it's noisy behind me, but I, I hope that you can hear me. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, this brings back a whole pile of old memories as I interacted when I was a younger man uh, with a bunch of uh, environmentalists of different stripes. And so I thought, I, when you mentioned monism, I heard, I was thinking of Parmenides, but I really don't think that uh, Parmenides has anything to do with the monism of Hegel. Uh, so I'll put that aside. I think uh, I live in Colombia, and so President Gustavo Petro has re referred explicitly to Third Roman Dynamics for his serious push for so-called decarbonization of the Colombian economy. So, which is quite uh, concerning. Um, and our first minister of mines, she was an actual degrowth advocate. Fortunately, she fell, she fell on her own sword because she did something illegal and she was forced to resign. But um, I'm, I, want, I wanted to talk about the second law of thermodynamics. I've been looking, I'm going to be giving the RTF talk in two weeks' time. It, and it's the replacement of continental science in the 19th century. And I'm focusing on the replacement of the luminiferous ether, as well as the electrodynamics of Wilhelm Weber, uh, by the work done by the British empiricists, read, led by Lord Kelvin and, and James Clerk Maxwell. Now, Lord Kelvin also happens to be the first to talk about heat death. So I have the suspicion that the thermodynamics, just as the, just as the work of Fresnel and Ampere was trashed or transformed or improved or whatever, whatever insulting word you want to use, by the British empiricists to transform it into its opposite, I suspect, but I haven't done my homework yet, that the thermodynamics of Lazare Carnot and his son, Sadi Carnot, was transformed by the British empiricists. So in fact, all this stuff about entropy is simply nonsense right from the very beginning. It's not that the second law of thermodynamics is in misapplied or misinterpreted, I suspect it's simply wrong. That the, the work of Clausius and, uh, and William Thompson, a.k.a. Lord Kelvin, and others is simply wrong. Remember, so the point was, heat death was proposed by Lord Kelvin in, nine, in 1851. Clausius only published his paper on entropy in 1865. 14 years later, and the paper from 1850 that Clausius um, uh, published, just a moment, let me get it, Über die Bewegenden Kraft der Wärme, and so on the moving force of heat. Now, what does he write in this paper? That there's a contradiction between Carnot's principle and the, concept, and the concept of conservation of energy. Now, why is this is important? Because that's exactly the attack that Hermann Helmholtz and Kelvin used 
to attack Weber's electrodynamics. Now, Weber was still alive at the time, so he was able to fight and fight back and ultimately demonstrate to the extent that it was possible with the knowledge of the time that it was not true. And it was only in, I think, the 1990s that uh, the Brazilian physicist uh, Andre Assis and others were able to prove that, uh, based on some work done by Schrodinger in the 1930s, that in fact, uh, Weber's uh, electrodynamics do not contradict the, con the law of conservation of energy. Now, I suspect that the same thing may well be the case for uh, Carnot's um, uh, Carnot's uh, uh, thermodynamics. But unfortunately, neither Lazare Carnot nor his son Sadi Carnot were alive when these accusations were being made, so they couldn't defend themselves. Um, so, with respect to nuclear energy, one of the biggest problems historically about nuclear energy was this concept of nuclear waste. But there was this idea that fast breeder reactors would be able to take the nuclear waste from one generation of reactors and use it as the input to the next generation of reactors. And this was called the, the closed nuclear uh, fuel cycle. Now, the Russians have solved this. It's and in, they put it into practice. So they developed the BN-600 and the BN-800 uh, fast neutron reactors in Belayask, and they're building the BN-1200, uh, which is planned to be online for 2027. Now, for the moment, it's, it's, not, it's not used for the full uh, uh, civilian nuclear... Uh, nuclear um, uh, nuclear reactor, uh, new, new, sorry, nuclear energy production, but it is clearly, it is clearly part of the project. It's no, it's no longer experimental technology. It's now proven technology. The point is that there's no, there's no valid reason for not using uh, uh, nuclear fission as uh, a future, uh, as a future, uh, um, um, as a future uh, massive uh, energy source. The technology exists. Hmm. And let, let's let I maybe. Uh, all, oh, yeah, go on. I, I think that's all I have in my notes. Um, it's just it's just everything that I heard in today's talks is like bringing back Murray Bookchin, uh, John Bellamy Foster, uh, yeah. pseudo Marxists. Um, um, I mean, it's it's it's. I think, I think it's clear that both the Chinese and the Russians are not dupes. They know exactly what uh, these Western pseudo-leftists are all about. I agree. Uh, they, they, may, they, they may from time to time say the right words to pretend that they're in agreement and so on, but they, they, they're not dupes. They know exactly what the story is about. Yeah. Well, I'm, and that, that's why I've been hesitant to even, this is a culmination of about two years worth of research, but I've, Part of me is nervous about that because I'm like, I don't want to blow their cover. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I think it's important that from the Western perspective that we understand that is this weird demented mirror is being held up to make us think that, oh, the, no, what they're doing is bad. And they're trying to infiltrate us with this green ideology. They think the same thing about us, <laughs> or at least, you know, they're, they're, they're weary of that, that being a possibility. But the truth is, they don't want to de-develop either. That you know, like we're 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 being kept kind of separate, and I'm sure the language and cultural barrier doesn't help. Um, mm -hmm. But it's important, I think, to see the root of these ideas, whether it be Christianity or Marxism or whatever. You know, pro-humanity sentiment can blossom through lots of things, right? And it doesn't yeah. have to be our way or their way. And there's only one, one right way. There's multiple ways to solve the puzzle, but as long as we're still working towards this same ultimate good and truth that is universal and, and not something that is um, relevant to any historical period that you can look at back at any point in human history and apply the same laws. Okay. Well then you're getting 
you're you're tapping into the correct laws and what you want to call them. If you if you're saying, oh, you're we're being infected by theology, oh, we're being infected by atheism. It's you know, it's just cutting the same pie a different way. Mm -hmm. But I'm well, I'm glad that I brought up a lot of it was it was a lot of ideas. So I'm glad that <laughs> I think this is a good audience for that though. It's sometimes yeah. um it's a, lot, a lot. it's a lot to cover. Yeah, I'm looking no, forward I, to hearing what you have to say too in your presentation. I was gonna say that that worked out Thank quite you. nicely as a little bit of a plug for everybody to tune in in two weeks for uh, for John Place's uh presentation upcoming. And uh and I think as well, like I, I'd like to see there's some le so many leads my god that you you raised um but like the nature as well of this uh break this this battle within china within the highest levels in that was it seems to really have come to a head in 20 between 2010 and 2012 um i was not as appreciative as i am now for some of those elements because we often just get shadows we don't get to be privy to we, we're not flies on the wall of these back channel backroom discussions um but it was it it did strike me that I I did a, a research paper a while ago on um a disciple of uh, Gregory Bateson, the MK Ultra operative, uh who was named David Hawk, who runs the Society for the Eternal Feminine, um, who was brought in to the Politburo back in 2007. And he describes, you know, he's very Tavistockian, but he describes how he was meeting with the 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 central committee members. And how he was really making a case that they should scrap Confucius, go with uh, with Taoism. That's the only future uh, for China. And and you know he was just going at length. And this this organization has been has like something like five hundred million dollars that they have a, that they've been bankrolled with, where they've been taking these princelesslings, like these 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 girls who are going to inherit huge wealth, you know, because of the one child policy. You got a lot of these girls in China. And they've been bringing them into resorts in in Texas and California to be essentially brainwashed around mm. some weird like their their websites are very strange, like using all of the the uh, the signature things you would see with with the creation of a synthetic cult that that maximizes sensualism as the new spirituality that, you know, tells yeah basically it's it's weird. But there, this is the a very nasty little fifth column. And, and the fact that he was able to be brought into such high level operating systems within China really bothered me. And the fact that you do have this skit, this break with the Shanghai click, uh, that was yeah. running, you know, this whole network in, uh, in uh, Shanghai and the, and what, uh, what, uh, Xi Jinping was able to do by bringing on the, the Belt and Road. Very fascinating. There, there's got, there's stories that I, I'm sure ha can be told or, or waiting to be told on this issue. And maybe that could be a future presentation <laughs> that we hear from you. But uh, but thank you very much for doing that and for bringing that light onto that those shadows. One one last comment. Hmm. Russia is capitalism with Russian characteristics, and China is socialism with Chinese characteristics, and both of them have about seventy percent of the uh, economy in the hands of the state. Right. So I think that's that's the distinction, so, right? Is running so, so your state. Fact, for so the benefit fact, of the people. And so and all strategic industries are in the hands of the state. Yeah. In in both countries. And that used to be that used to be like thought of as what socialism was, right? That used to be kind of but now socialism is just gender pronouns and blue hair and ecological destruction and client crying about the climate. Um it used to be about the how do we decide like Oh, should industry be controlled rationally by our, you know, elected officials, or, you know, for the benefit of the economy so that the economy can grow? Um, but now now what leftists say, and I have I have an essay on this. Now they say they want to nationalize fossil fuel in order to shut it down. Um, I have a whole essay about how they work in conjunction basically with Mark Carney to create stranded assets so they can therefore financially justify basically financially destroying uh, infrastructure you know now they have they use actual like just blowing up pipelines they use uh legislation legalese lawsuits to kill infrastructure and you know they use financial uh tricks now to, to create 
situations, it's all it's all in the name of deindustrialization and degrowth. All right, we got a list of people here. So let's let's move through some questions. Uh, Edward. Hey, Fox. Hey, uh, nice to talk to you. Hey, Matt, thanks for hosting. It's uh, really great to be here. And uh, great presentation, Fox. You know, really beautiful slides and everything. I do got to push back. I've been engaging with Matt on this. Just Matt and I just kind of connected the last few days, and he and I have been engaging on this exact same set of topics. So I'm, uh, it was a pretty timely uh, presentation here. Uh, I, I want to push back on a couple things with you, uh, starting with the idea that ecology equates to Malthusianism. Um, I really don't think that, that that's a fair... Uh, uh, a, a fair connection to make. Some environmentalists are Malthusian, but by no means are all uh, environmentalists Malthusian. Because I, so I just wrote a paper and I sent it to Matt. He was reading. I titled it "Towards an Ecological Civilization," and it's you know it's all about growth and it's all about. Um, and I took the term from China, and it's not a it's not a it's not a pagan term. It's a it's a Chinese Confucian term, and it's a reflection of a return to traditional Chinese spirituality that Xi Jinping has been leading that has been a huge improvement over the mistakes uh, of Mao, of his, you know, harsh anti-spirituality that led to the, you know, massive disaster and mass murder of the Cultural Revolution. They're going back to traditional values of which eco ecological civilization is a traditional eco uh, Chinese value. And so I'm promoting the same kind of stuff that Cynthia is promoting in her videos of all these Asian cities, deeply green and integrating back into nature. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing sinister about it. And the idea of ecology, it is does relate to paganism in the sense that it relates to the mother, religion of the mother, and humanity's oldest, most universal, most popular, most salvation religion. Not something, I mean, there's you know sinister elements in later pagan times, but like the idea of its own is just mother and father. Um, and again, the idea of monism, you seem to think is somewhat uh, sinister. I got to push back on that too. It's like, that's just traditional Hinduism. It's a traditional Eastern worldview. That's where the Germans got it, Herman Hess and these other intellectuals. They picked it up from India. The swastika comes from India. The Nazis perverted it and turned it into something nasty. But this is a traditional Indian spirituality. Edward, do you, do you uh, have like a question or something? Or do you well, just want to say you kind of disagree with everything you, you just what heard? What do you argue? Because, I, I think to engage like, the discussion a little more on like, are we really promoting Christian values, Christian section, section gender? And like, where are we going with with what are we trying to do in the future here? Um, because I think there's a little broader set of ideas and we're kind of holding ourselves back. Well, let me ask um, you a question. Discussion. Yeah. Why why were the Nazis able to subvert it? Why were the Nazis what, able what, to what what what's the fundamental flaw in this ideology that was made it so that the Nazis were able to pervert an otherwise good ideology? Well, well, the Nazis let all this sort of, you know, Aryan white supremacist master race stuff where they wanted to dominate the world. That's not that has nothing to do with that. What the swastika is, that's sort of like Krishna religion. It's a it's a, a there, that's nothing from. So they just made uh, it up out of thin air. What the Aryan master race stuff. It just has no relation. They just kind of made it up separately. Oh, no, they picked up other. I'm saying the the, the theology of 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 having a of of having a. A worldview of a dualistic worldview where the church teaches where God where you're separate from God versus a a a worldview where you see that consciousness is the underlying substrate of material reality and that in that in that we're all that all this consciousness is all is all connected. Um, this is just traditional Eastern worldview um, that it becomes perverted by people with ideological agendas of power and 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 domination is something different. Um, but there's nothing about power and domination in that perspective in and of itself. I mean, the Nazis were nasty. Um, um, yeah, I think that the underpinning uh, thing that 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 undermines this stuff is that it does see human beings and and animals as no different. I think that's yeah, the, yeah, the, no, exactly. The structural it's a traditional, flaw indi which is exactly itself, this ideology. a traditional indigenous worldview. Which is actually something that I believe in as well. I think we are all part right. of an integrated. Well, you you, you of believe life. that that humans and other animals are totally on equal plane. We're obviously like not the same. Worm. Obviously, humans okay. have a different intellectual capability and a different material capability in terms of what we can do. But to like us. killing a worm or killing a human, I is think killing the, the integrated it's web of life. Death is part of life. We kill to live. Um, I'm not. I'm not anti-death. 
What I'm saying is that there is an integrated web of life that is like a hammock that we're all sitting on, that we're all part of. And if we are dumb enough to cut it all to pieces, we're going to kill ourselves. It's not Malthusian. We're not going to run out of resources and starve to death, but we are what, dumb enough. What evidence to do you have that we're, what evidence, what evidence do you have that we're dumb enough to do that? What deforestation doesn't happen? We had deforestation before the Industrial Revolution. All the environmental movements come out of environmental dis disasters that spark the environmental movements in the first place. We had the Cuyahoga River and Cleveland catching so fire. Your belief is that we're not improving the quality of the environment? We totally are. We totally are. And a free market environment, free market capitalism has actually been the best method to improve. Um, uh, improve the, we have the best track record environmentally on resource extraction in the West. You look what happened in, in I broke so the environmentalists over fracking. So then we're not destroying the planet. New York. What's that? So then we're not destroying the planet and that we're good and we're not stupid. We are capable of destroying the planet or capable of, of fixing it. If we have to be, we have to make the affirmative de decision to be ecological or else in our ignorance, we will be unecological and destroy the web of life. If you look what happened in the drilling industries and oil and gas industry, I broke with the Greens. My break with the Green Party and with the Greens in general came over fracking in New York State. Because I, I was at Cornell. I lived in New York State. I was right on the front lines of all this stuff. I, I, I make my living in solar power. A true believer uh -huh. in all this stuff and all the renewables. And um, and okay. so, but I was, I was, I was, it. I was, you're laughing. So I just, uh, I, it's just a funny coincidence. I mean, I'm in New York as well. Yeah, I, was, I saw that on your website. Where in New York are you? I'm in the Hudson Valley, um, Kingston. I, I, I spent most of my adult life in Ithaca. I was there for much of my life. Um, and deep <laughs> green, and as you know, it's like the most deep green, off the charts, lefty community and the, yeah. the left of Berkeley. I mean, it's the most lefty town in the entire freaking country, as far as I know. <laughs> yep. Um, and yep. I broke with them over fracking. It was that, that was the heartbed of where the anti-fracking came along. And it came out of Cornell. A lot of the academia comes out of Cornell, Bob Howarth. The guy who's running the methane satellite stuff, he's out of Cornell. I've met that guy. Um, so I was originally anti-fracking because when they first came along, they botched all the work. We go back to Dimock, Pennsylvania in 2007, 2006. There were real problems because the first wave of drilling that came through, they were irresponsible. They didn't know what they were doing. They ran roughshod over the communities. And when they made screwed things up and made real problems, they made people sign NDAs and try to sweep it under the rug. And everybody got pissed off for good reason. But then what happened was industry responded. Um, the regulators responded. The beauty of American oil and gas industry is that it's not nationalized. And so we have, it's like a million subcontractors. And so you swap out one lousy subcontractor with a different subcontractor who can do Ed, the work better. I'm, I'm so sorry, Ed. I, we've got all right, all right, 12, that's fine. But we got to take it up another list. time, Fox. We uh, got a lot of well, stuff. Well, sure. We'll have a debate sometime. Yeah, we could, that that's good. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Um, all right. Uh, do we go into the next question, uh, Fox, or do you want to say anything else or next question? Yeah, yeah. Keep going. Next yeah. question. All right. So, Lee, you still there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, no. So I just thought of something on the topic of uh, talking about an effective, effective Marxist uh, critique of the green agenda, where it comes from more of a material standpoint, as opposed to uh, some of the examples uh, you were using. It was slightly more... Uh, they were just equating it to Christianity, which I thought was kind of strange because usually when I hear the the Marxist critiques, they don't typically uh, like that. That's not usually where they go. They don't go into like a more spiritual assessment of it. Uh, so like there's one author, which if you haven't heard of him, you should definitely check him out. He's in China, uh, Hu Mao Ren. Uh, he's a professor at the School of Marxism um, at Beijing University. And uh He's also a director of the Chinese Dialectical Materialism Research Association, um, Beijing Philosophical Society. And uh, he also works at a pretty high level uh, strategic think tank in Beijing. Um, and something he said, and I translated it to English, he said, um, in the face of China's rise, developed capitalism overseas has used the so-called environmental and ecological protection movements to obstruct China's construction and development. Under this banner, it seems that there's no relevance of class interests, but simply for the survival of human beings. But in reality, the use of such a banner is very vicious in obstructing China's construction and development. Western imperialists have moved a lot of environmentally destructive businesses to developing countries, and their own lives are less affected 
by the destroyed environment. But they do not allow the Chinese people as well as other developing people to have a better life. And they hope that they they should always be at the top of what they call the so-called human food chain. This is why they keep on appealing and demanding that for the sake of environmental protection, for the sake of ecological protection, the developing countries at large should not develop heavy chemical industries and they should not allow their own countries to be on par with the capitalist countries so as to enable their own people to attain a higher standard of living. And then the last thing is, what China is doing now is conducive to the construction and development of the country, as well as to a better, healthier, and happier life for its people. The Western bourgeoisie seems to be powerless to do anything about this, except to do bad things that are detrimental to others and to themselves. So I just wanted to share that one as well, because uh, it, it kind of shows that you, there's like people in China right at the top of the the Marxist field of study who are also calling this out too. Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. The, and you, you don't even have to go to China. You look at the, the hypocrisy of the environmental movement, which is they d don't embrace nuclear energy, which is among its many other benefits has a very small footprint. It's a, for the amount of power it produces, it takes up a tiny amount of space, um, very little waste, no, no emissions, you know? So the fact that the environmental movement rejects nuclear energy is a, in itself an obvious contradiction that, that environmentalism is basically a tool to, it, it's not actually about caring about the environment. It's about undermining, it's, it's used as a geopolitical tool to undermine China, Russia, developing nations, Africa. They want Africans to develop on solar panels. It's it's absolutely disgusting. Um, yeah, totally. I'll share the link to the, the article in, in the chat as well. And he talks yeah. in about the nuclear stuff too. And he, that's another point he makes. He just, I was going to read the whole article and he says how, how stupid that is. It's like, if they like the environment, why do they hate nuclear? And then yeah. meanwhile, China is building like nuclear powered freight ships now, like those giant container ships they're putting them out on nuclear power which is crazy yeah that's the funny thing i have a lot of friends who are nuclear advocates in the united states but they're very anti-russia and china i'm like if you're a nuclear advocate you should love russia and china because they're they're like superheroes in the nuclear sphere but they can't get past that sort of like western hegemony and you know that that worldview of like being anti-russia and china is like it, it's so hard to, to break through that, but yeah, please send that article. That sounds cool. Yep. It has just been sent in the chat and it will be available when this video is up on YouTube as will be available. All of the associated videos that you uh, mentioned as you were speaking and delivering your lecture, that is all going to be for those listening on YouTube available in the description box under this, uh, this video. Uh, so the next question goes to history man. Yeah. Hey Matt. Um, so you're hearing my voice for the first time. Um, so I was wondering, this is a question to Fox. Um, clearly, there is a massive problem with chemicals and toxins that are being dumped into the environment at record rates. And BRICS countries aren't doing anything about it. No one's doing anything about it. I believe this is part of the depopulation agenda. It's a silent kill on humanity, ultimately. Question is, why are we putting so much faith in nation states or, you know, um, centralized power in general, you know, because they're all sort of just fighting for, you know, a seat at the table. Who's going to be top king? BRICS is controlled opposition. You guys don't agree with that, but chemicals and toxins. So like I said, that is um, my question to you. Um, you know, do you think there's a serious problem with that? Um, I think that there are absolutely side effects to technology that we should deal with. Um, but I, I don't think that there's a conspiracy to destroy humanity through uh, technology uh, as, as you as you see it. I mean, sure, there's some people who use technology for nefarious purposes, but you know, well, are we going to say, well, that's why we're going to go back to living in grass huts? Because well, no, I don't, I don't agree. Technology with that. I... is going to secret is going to be used by the bad guys to secretly kill us all. Well, that's not what, well, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this, I don't agree. Uh, I, I, I like technology, but 
you know, I just don't think it's good that it's used in the hands of centralized power. Well, centralized power can be used for very nefarious purposes, just like technology. Um, you know, Matt has pointed out before, which I think is brilliant, is that government is a form of technology itself and that it's only as good as, how, you know, how we use it and how we build it um, yeah. and what we use it for. So uh, centralization of, of uh, government can work really, really well in optimizing uh, the economy in, in acting as a conductor to an orchestra and creating a better paradigm for, sm for smaller local economies, right? If the big economy is working and the central nervous system is working, then all the smaller parts can work better in concert as well. Um, so I don't, I, this idea that we all have to decentralize, um, is the solution and that centralization is automatically bad. Um, I think that is throwing the baby out with the bathwater, um, because it's saying that any, any potential for bad is a reason to never do anything that could bring us to the next level, which again is like nuclear energy, right? Nuclear energy, it's, you see the same repeating pattern throughout everything, right? Is that. Yeah, yeah, when things are big, they can go wrong, but they can also be a, an immense power for good and then bring us to a higher level. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not opposed to nuclear power at all. I'm actually in favor. Actually, yeah. Lee has a very good point. Monopolize private interest or central power too. Ah, yeah, that's actually, I, that's a good point. Not just the state, that is true. Um, but however, I was actually also thinking that... Um, um, what was I gonna? I was for, I forgot what I was gonna ask. Oh yeah, so basically, uh, if Fox, uh, have you ever heard of a guy named Jesse Zerowell? Um, no. hmm, very smart guy, or Riley Wagaman. In fact, Riley Wagaman is a very good. Hey, uh, history man. Like, I appreciate you asking a question and sharing some points of disagreement. That's that's good. But I mean, at the end of the day, just simply, we're not here to start promoting all sorts of other voices who would just completely disagree with all the points that Fox just said. Not they're, necessarily. Riley they would. would no, disagree. I mean, they, these are people who completely disagree. They're black pill to the extreme and disregard all of the points that Fox has just developed with a lot of rigor. So why would you just choose to go in and just start doing that? This is a Q&A period, discussion period. Let's do yeah, that. You're, you're right. Yeah. Thanks. I was just trying to bring up another another uh, another person in the media who actually lives in Russia. So, yeah, there's a lot of people who live in Russia who disagree with Riley Wagman. Like GRU Tim Kirby. What? There's a lot Never. of people in Russia who disagree with Riley Wagman. Yeah. Who's ignoring a lot of spectrums of reality when he's making his very black pilled ana analyses. And uh, we've talked about this ad for a long time. So please, like have a bit of respect for the medium. You know exactly what the position is and everything he's saying is completely, it's just going against everything. Like he's basically promoting a worldview that ignores everything that Fox just laid out. I agree with a lot of what Fox said though. I, I'm aware you agree with a lot of what he said, but you seem to be a bit confused and you don't see a point of disagreement. The fact that you would bring up Riley Wagaman and all of these other things um, no, it, it means that there's there's some blind spots here that you're hold, or just history man, please. My bad. Okay. Uh, Louis, are you still there? Uh, well, I just uh, the question that I wrote down the two question. I are didn't you... have to go online. Uh, what's your definition of uh, pagan? Like, does it include a country dweller, rural person living there? This is the fox. You're you're asking if his definition of pagan is synonymous with country dweller? If it includes, or if that's how it's defined. Yep. No, I've I've heard that posed before, but no. When I talk about paganism, I'm talking about um, worshiping the natural world and having, you know, like multiple gods and not, not the, the, the religions that are sort of pre pre Christianity, pre the, the, um, Abrahamic religions that, but, you know, pre Plat Platonic, Plat 
Platonism, things that see like basically just uh, worship the natural, like the soil and the, the earth and the worms and the rocks and just are limited to the physical world um, and see that as sort of the the spiritual uh the where to where to draw spirituality from but no i've i've heard it referred to as just country people no i i'd argue that in in places like the the united states most people most country rural folks are christians thank you uh susan and doris there was a question on veganism from Susan and Doris. Yep. So oh, the question okay. is, where does veganism, does veganism fit into the picture? If so, where? Yeah. So I, I kind of left in that little s snippet at the end where the guy jokes about being a vegan after he talks to Peter Singer and has that ridiculous conversation. Um, and Peter Singer wrote the book, uh, The Animal Liberation, which I purchased when I was 14 because I was a vegetarian for uh, from ages 10 to 19. Um, so I get it and I get like the, you know, people not wanting to eat meat and I have no problem with people who choose to be vegans. Um, there's a difference between just choosing a diet based on what you personally feel is right for you for whatever reason, health beliefs, whatever. Um, and then, and then a political veganism, which is kind of a movement that became popular Oh God, I would say probably like the same time time period we were talking about today, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, where it became more about equating human beings with animals and seeing, you know, eating meat as a way of punishing people. The, the perfect example, the perfect incarnation of this is PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, um, who are political vegans, who see um the suffering of animals as equivalent to the suffering of human beings yeah. um and they they think that like all eating animals having pets anything that humans do to interact with animals is bad okay that's more what i'm starting to see around is that veganism and it's like it's different than vegetarianism <laughs> yeah well vegetarian <laughs> still includes eating animal products so yeah. the veganism is kind of an extreme form and that doesn't mean that all vegans are like that i mm -hmm. like i have nothing against right. people who just want to eat that way mm -hmm. it is it's like the political veganism yeah but did yeah. political veganism start with this whole crew here like when you were talking about the eco you know did um political veganism start there is more uh, what I'm i i gotta dig into the history of it more okay. but uh i believe it it, it did start it might have actually been a British thing that started oh. too, but um, it did. Okay. It definitely started before Peter Singer, um, okay. but he he kind of popularized it with his book. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think the differentiation of political veganism is a, it's a new term I've never thought about before. But uh, versus like an authentic, because the question is always, why are you doing something? You know, what what's your motivation? And the thing itself is usually as a practice neither good nor bad it's the it's your motive it's what's in the heart that determines uh to what degree is it uh is it participating in in this or that but political veganism that's a funny idea i like well, it. i, I mean, had to come up with a term because people would get like offended they're like saying yeah. oh you you hate me because i'm a vegan i don't hate you because you're a vegan eat whatever makes you ha do what makes you happy you know that's that's my <laughs> position but when you start turning into a moral argument that's where we you know yeah yeah, a moral political argument. That's where we start to go astray. Um, Marilyn, are you still there? Marilyn Langoise. Yes, yes. Hi. Hey. Sorry, I'm cooking right now as, as I'm listening to this. Thank you for the presentation. I just caught the end of it, unfortunately, but very interesting what I did here. So my question is... Um, how do we make sure that uh, that tech, and I don't mind technological advances, I use them all the time, I'm using them right now to be participate in this meeting, but how do we make sure technological advances are used in ways that truly benefit people and their higher purpose and not for surveillance, control, 
World Economic Forum style Great Reset, Harari style transhumanism, um, fake meat made out of bugs, um, and even, you know, social credit scores using facial recognition, that kind of thing. It's so a, how, do we, how do we do do that? That's a great, it's a great question. And it, it's one that you have to always be asking, right? And it's the, probably one of the most important, if not the most important question. I think the answer to it is what, what Matt just said about veganism. Well, why, what are we using it for? What, why are we doing this? What is the purpose of the technology? Are we doing it to advance humanity or are we doing it to control humanity, right? Are we anti-Malthusian or are we pro-humanity? And I think that's the baseline of not, not what are the material effects. That's important too. Sure. What are the results of what's happening that play out? Um, but it, it always begins with why. And that's what separates us. That's why historical materialism is interesting and it's useful. But ultimately, we decide with our minds. We can decide ahead of time why we're doing something. Uh, we, it don't, we're not like my dog just – whatever happens in the world, he just has to deal with the consequences. We can think ahead of time, why are we doing this? What is the purpose behind this technology? Are we using it to better humanity or are we – using it to control humanity and reduce the population or, or whatnot. Um, and, and, and in a lot of cases, technology can be used in both for, for both the great good and great, um, you know, nefarious purposes. So um, that's something where we can never really get lazy. <laughs> and we always have to keep questioning, why are we using this? What's the purpose? Um, and stay on it, you know? Is that a good answer? <laughs> Thank you. Well, but, but that gets us into politics and how do we, as 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 people and citizens, have some influence over how this technology gets used, and 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 also in a way that you know really benefits everybody, including those who are you know less well off and doesn't just all go to enrich the few oligarchs that seem to be running things. So it gets into a political question too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think. Um, our government is only as good as the consent of the governed. If if we allow things to happen without our consent and we're being passive and we're, we're allowing for our society to be run in a way that is not conducive with or, or goes along with our moral compass um, towards the good and towards truth and reason and beauty, then we're not participating in our 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 society, we're not taking responsibility. Um, and it, it's important for us to, to, to do that and to be, to, to, we have to give our consent in order to allow these things to happen. Um, it, I mean, it is a big philosophical question, right? And I'm saying big, big things where it's like, what does that even mean in, in practical terms? You're telling me to go vote, you know? And, and I think that the biggest, the biggest thing that you can do, there's tons of practical things you can do, but Honestly, I think one of the most important things is what we're doing today, which is learning the, the truth and the, the history of things, understanding things, picking apart things that um, may make you have like a knee jerk reaction. Like I, I talked about Marxism or or this or that or the China, Russia, things that are you're trained that you've been trained by the powers that be to have sort of a knee jerk reaction to say, no, you know what? I'm, I'm actually going to use my mind and I'm going to learn what is truthful, what is reasonable and what is good because we all have that ability within us, but we're conditioned to think that we can't trust our own judgment and intuition. But once you start actually understanding reality for what it is and history and the context of like where you exist in this historical period um, and what led to this moment, you can then be more um, uh, able to take action on the future because you understand what led to the moment that brought you to today and what role you play in that moment, in this moment in history. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, nicely said. So just to, uh, 
let people know at 530, I've got a, an appointment, so we're going to have to round this out by 530, giving us a total of about seven minutes. And I know Jerry's got a question. Monty's got a question. Um, and then there's a couple of requests for follow-ups. So I, I sadly don't think that we can do all of that in this particular session. So let's go with uh, Monty and Jerry. Let's get you guys in. Try to keep the, the questions short, and uh, and we'll we'll have to round this thing out, unfortunately, for today. I'm sorry. Jerry, it's all yours. Uh, no, no, Mo uh, Monty was on first. Monty, go. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, I'll shorten this, even though you spurred a whole lot of thoughts with this. But uh, <laughs> very briefly, uh, you know, I appreciate your idea of not identifying particularly with either Marx or capitalism. I think it comes to down to the idea of value uh, and and how our economy is... is uh, should be purpose-driven rather than profit-driven. And in light of that, I'd like to segue very briefly back to your comment on LaRouche. Uh, today I was on a Zoom call with a conference in New York City uh, 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 giving tribute to LaRouche and the idea of the Oasis plan. And there was a, a, uh, a diplomat on there from Yemen. He was actually a counselor or advisor to the Yemeni Leadership Council. And he gave about a 10-minute presentation on Lyndon LaRouche and his whole, basically he made it very clear going back to the 90s that his ideas for the Silk Road, uh, for the, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, for the World Land Bridge, as a matter of fact, on his backdrop, he had a World Land Bridge behind him for his presentation and he held up a book on the Silk Road. And I think just under, if you could comment on this, that my view of things is LaRouche and his ideas going way back to the 70s and 80s really laid the foundation for this idea of peace through development on purpose-driven economy, on having a vision for the future. And uh, if you would agree with that, maybe just comment on that, I would appreciate it. Yeah, I out of anybody I've ever, there's a lot of people I've come across as an anti-Malthusian, and I've always been an anti-Malthusian um, and, you know, I, I came across Marx and Marx had some, some thoughts against Malthus, Julian Simon, who was a libertarian who lived in like the late 20th century. Um, he had some ideas that were very anti-Malthusian and very good, but LaRouche is the only person who has struck at the core of, you know, the heart of what Malthusianism is and why it's bad and his ideas about the physical economy and uh, peace through development are so vitally important because just for the idea of like the, the very simple idea that if you have mutual interests with somebody, you build a bridge and you build trade and you have, you, you trade goods and you both build up each other's economy, you have no reason to destroy them. <laughs> you literally have no reason to destroy them. You, you, your life is better off with creating a partnership of win-win cooperation, which is what I, what the Chinese use a lot, um, and and that is just such an an easy concept to grasp, and it's so true. It's one of those things where it's true on the the ground level, and it goes up and up and up and up. You know, I I'm a business person, and when bit when my local business people are also doing well, I'm doing well. That I think that's what the Rising Tide Foundation is named after, right? Right, the Rising Tide lifts all boats. Um, is that if we can build together, if we can build the world, then we we have less and less and less incentive to destroy it and to destroy each other. And I think those ideas are so, so powerful and so potent. And um, it can't be un underemphasized the contribution that LaRouche made um, to the world as an American. And I think we should look to him um, for inspiration um, and that might not happen in our lifetimes because he's been so vilified by the evil people that are in charge of 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 our country right now. But hopefully that is that is waning. So, mm -hmm. actually, on, on that note, yeah, the uh, the uh, the fact that it's there has been this sort of electric fence mentally put into the minds of so many people in the western part of the world where Larouche um, lived and fought, but. There's no such uh, effective electric fence that we've seen that has been sustainable in the minds of cultures in India and China and Russia. And in fact, the the deputy um, uh, speaker of the Russian Duma, not deputy speaker, deputy uh, president of the Russian Duma. Um, Sergey. Huh? 
What's that? Sergey Glazyev. Bogdanov. No, Bog Boganov. Um, Volodin? No, no, uh, Bog Boganov. I believe is his uh, last name. It's forgetting it all of a sudden. But I, but um, my publisher in Russia just sent me a book um, on a New Deal in the American system in Russia, uh, co-written by. Um, I mean, this is this is a very very high level influential uh, figure who's just written a book on the influence of Hamiltonian economics, List, Vita, and the entire American system in Russia. Um, with a look to China and other nations. So you have, and also, I mean, LaRouche comes up prominently in this book. Um, so yeah, and there there is a, a very important receptivity and resonance right now with major leaders. Um, and I've, I've, I'm quite persuaded that the entire Belt and Road Initiative looking uh, is highly, how it has been brought online, how it has been deployed since 2013 when it was first announced, um, I think is very much influenced Maybe not 100 percent, but I mean, I think that it, the influence of the Schiller Institute and LaRouche specifically as far as his ideas and policy orientation going back to the, the 70s, but really especially with the in the late 80s, early 90s in China is uh, is pronounced. I don't think it would be happening in the way it is were it not for had it not been informed by those considerations that were brought forth by LaRouche in terms of how to make this thing happen, how to understand the oligarchy properly and their tricks so, yeah, very, very, very world historic moment that we're living through, very much influenced by LaRouche that a lot of people are are underestimating. And the, and the embrace in Yemen by the advisors of the leadership of Yemen is of these ideas is also very, very interesting, too. So thank you, Monty, for bringing that up. I just postponed my 530 to 535. Uh, so that gives you a little bit more time, Jerry, to have the last uh, the last word. Go for it. OK, good. Thanks. Um Fox, I, I, I appreciate your presentation very much, and you keep pounding away this idea of Malthusianism into our brains. It's very good. I just wanted to ask a question about China, because I think a lot of people are misinformed about it, too. But in my watching China today, they're producing a lot of new nuclear plants. They're increasing their number of coal plants. Uh, as well, they're massively increasing their solar power installation and also, you know, uh, wind farms and that. And for some people, it's a contradiction. They can't figure it out. And in my mind, the way I explain it to people is that if you're like China and you're anti-Malthusian, you want to have growth and increase your amount of power, electricity, so that your so-called renewables, you know, like solar power and windmills, is just in addition to your other power, to increase it. And I say that because here in the West, we have a different mindset. It's, it's like we're anti-Malthusians. And so we build, build these windmills, and I call them sunbeam catchers, so that we can shut down a coal plant or we build them so we can shut down an oil plant. It's it's not to supplement our energy production, but it's actually to decrease it when you think of it. And I, I just think of that because your, your presentation on Malthusian versus anti-Malthusian. So I just wanted your, your thinking about that, if you think the same way or not, if you have I other ideas. Yeah, I totally agree with what you, with everything you that you just said. Um, that is the fundamental difference is when we build renewables, it destroys our infrastructure. When they do it, it doesn't. And why is that? They can cover the the mountainside with solar panels. They're increasing their their solar panels and their renewables. Um, why why are they doing that? Well, maybe for a few reasons, right? Is that it makes them look good on the world stage, right? There's less reason for people for you know, the, the, the green elites to say, oh, see, China's not doing anything. Okay. Well, they're building a crap load of uh, renewable energy too, because they have the resources to do so. They have the natural resources to build out all this stuff. And they're not afraid to mine for their own natural resources. Unlike us in America, we don't want to touch our pristine land and mine for the, the resources that we would need to build these things. We want to outsource that to our our factory of China, <laughs> right? Um, and then third, like they the way they manage land is way different than we do in the United States. They can just 
build over massive tracts of land. Whereas in the United States, you need permission to not only build out these giant plots of land that you need in order to build uh, renewable energy, but you need all the connections to hook these things up to the grid. And, you know, the, we have a private property system where in China, they are more along the socialist lines of having, you know, the government owns all the property. There is private property as far as like people own their own houses, but the, the, pro, the, the land is owned by the government. Therefore, they get rid of that, the parasitic class that just holds onto land so that they can't develop it, which is the problem that we have in our, in our, one of the many problems that we have in our country. Um, so yeah, I totally agree with you, Jerry. Um, I think that, you know, China, it, it, it's so easy to have that knee jerk reaction. Oh, well, they're building solar panels. Yeah. Well, they're also building a ton of coal. They're building a ton of nuclear. They're building everything because they're just building, you know? Um, so yeah. Yeah, on that note, I I, uh, I had a discussion on on my show on TNT Radio with a very very good uh, American patriot, and he shared a uh, an unfortunately too common um, view of China, because which he suspects, as most conservative Americans suspect, China is at the heart of all their problems. Right. Uh, that China's you know part of the logic was look, China's not even abiding by the COP twenty eight or the Paris Accords. They're just polluting and they're producing carbon dioxide and they're not getting in trouble for it. But we're the ones who are getting in trouble for doing that. And my response was, well, you could look at it that way, or you could look at it, but at, from the standpoint that they're using the power of the sovereign nation state that they have to protect their people and and remove themselves from things like the Paris Accords that they had formerly got locked into, and now they're out of it. And why aren't we doing that? Like, instead of thinking about it the way he was thinking about it, why not just reframe it a little bit and think, well, why are we allowing our government to stay uh, in shackled to this thing? Or, you know, mRNA, whatever you want, you know, like there, there's that elements too, right? There, And it's not like China hasn't gotten a lot of pressure by um, the IPCC, the, the all sorts of globalist institutions or private corporations that have put tons of pressure on them to bend to the will and give up their sovereignty for this, uh, you know, pagan Gaia renewal agenda. But they they chose to stand firm. And why have we been wobbly? Not even wobbly. Why have we broken? Um, that's the, I think, a, a healthier way of looking at the whole thing. So. Uh, I, absolutely. Yeah. But. Fox, you just busted out of the water. You annihilated so many axioms. You brought so much context that I adore into this conversation. So much nuance. Anybody who's still holding on to nominalistic uh, logic have to really, I think, take a step back, revisit some of what you just composed again and again. We're going to have this up uploaded on YouTube uh, in the next 24 hours. So thank you so much for doing this. Next week, we've got Alex Dimitrios, who's going to carry these ideas into yet another chapter of the story we'll see what i'm curious to see what he comes up with and then we've got john place and many other great presentations coming up in the weeks ahead so thank you so much fox and thank you everybody for joining